And so no fail is just kind of bringing it back to like, hey man, what were you taught when you learned how to ride a bike? Having a flyer go off somewhere else is almost as serious as a push shot for it. Well, I think because I mean, the original weapon lights that were issued were like, what, 60 meters or something like yep. that? Yeah. Hey everyone, Matt Lanford here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. This is Modcast episode 217. We're going to be discussing refining instructor development. We're going to be talking about methods, people, selection of instructors, all kinds of things. Um, this is actually a discussion that has been in the works for a very long time. Uh, Ian and Mike Lewis brought this up some time ago, and finally we have the right panel to delve into these concepts. And it's kind of cool. I, I, this, is, this is one of those topics that I, I, I really appreciate um, because it's not just a military com conversation. It's not just a law enforcement conversation. These kinds of concepts can apply across the, uh, across the board. So it's going to be a good discussion. So before we start up, big thanks to Felster Holsters. If you are looking for, let's see here, what should we discuss? Let's talk about the flex. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of appendix carry. Filster makes this thing called the flex. And essentially what it is, is, is a, pa a panel of material. It's very thin that has spots on it, areas on it that you can add uh, holster, knives, tourniquets, all kinds of pouches, all kinds of stuff. Highly recommend it. It, it adds a little, bit of, a little bit of comfort. It adds some stability. And it's kind of nice to be able to have, unlike these cod, Kydex cod pieces, that don't really bend with your body where you have the holster and your mag next to each other. The flex allows complete movement and freedom and it's far more comfortable. I love the, the customization of it as well. You can get it in multiple sizes. It's really a nice, uh, nice feature to, or a nice uh, object to use. Also big thanks to Facts and Firearms if you're in the market for a threaded barrel for your pistol, whether it be a Glock, MP, you name it. If you need a new AR-15, barrel, an AK barrel. If you're building something from scratch, you should probably check out Faxon because they have all kinds of parts, whether it be a bolt or even an upper. As a matter of fact, Nate Osborne, uh, Range Wisdom on Instagram has been doing some videos about his pistol caliber carbine upper from Faxon and he's absolutely excited about its performance and uh, despite what people say, they're actually kind of fun. So that's Faxon. Also, this episode is brought to you by the letters PP and S from Walther. Uh, Walther's a sponsor of the podcast. I like Walther pistols. Um, they were they were a bit of a surprise to me. I had always tried. I've always used Glocks uh, throughout law enforcement for the most part. I've tried CZs. Really like CZs. And then someone said, "Hey, you got to check out." As a matter of fact, it was uh, Jim Dexter and Steve Fisher, and they said, "You got to check out the PPQ." And I did. And you know, honestly, if you're if you go shooting frequently and you go to a range that has guns available to rent or to try, check out that PPQ. I really think you'll be you'll be surprised. It's a really nice gun for what it is. Um, it, in my opinion, it has the best production trigger for a striker fired pistol out there. Outstanding pistol, and the pricing is yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot lower than I'd anticipate. I think they need to bump up the pricing, but that's just me. Lastly, big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. Um, if you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the network. We have some large training. We have a large training event on the horizon for next year. Uh, Patreon subscribers get first access on registering. We have a lot of friends coming over to teach here in Utah, and it's going to be awesome. If you happen to be in law enforcement, and I'm even ex I'm expanding that to military, there happen I've already gotten pinged by a couple military type people who are interested in, in taking advantage of this, I do have sponsorships available. So if you happen to be one of those decision maker types, if you're one of those people that possibly might be able to help your organization with some new concepts or new ideas, hit me up at matt at primaryandsecondary.com. I'm happy to talk to you about how to qualify and how to apply for this sponsorship. Uh, I think I'm looking at about 50 of these sponsorships. The idea is to uh, just basically raise the bar for all of us. And it, it starts with little tiny concepts like what we're going to be talking about in this training. So excited about that. My background's in law enforcement, been doing it for over 20 years now. Uh, currently working in a, as an administrative sergeant. I do a lot of behind the scenes stuff, whether it be training or organization or supply. I do patrol on occasion. It's nice to get out and about on occasion, but I really have a passion for this and the ability to help out the entire department. Um, 
is a, is a wonderful thing. And ultimately it is also, it's, it is helping my community and I love it. So let's go pick on some more people to, for them to give their little bio background thingies. I'm going to start with Ian because he's right there. I'm muting. Hi, uh, Ian Tashima. I currently work at the California Army National Guard on the full-time side, uh, primarily working at um, or for the state marshalship coordinator. Uh, I also work on the MDA side at the local regional training institute down in San Luis Obispo. Uh, I've got a few deployments under my belt. After my first, I was asked by a leadership at an organization called Task Force Warrior, uh, local uh, pre-mobilization training site. Got uh, hooked into the training uh, role there, and then uh, that was back in 2009, I think it was. So for about a decade now, I've been in the training realm on the military side. Pitch courses on the civ side as well. Um, what else? Uh, just started up a uh, new website that focuses on uh, training doctrine uh, as it applies specifically to the Army, but um, lessons learned can be applied also to the uh, civilian as well as the uh, law enforcement uh, sectors, I believe. Uh, so, plank owners, uh, including myself, Dave, Mike, uh, Todd, Poisson, uh, that can't make it with us tonight. Uh, but you'll find folks that um, were deeply involved in the uh, creation, the validation, the codification of basically everything the Army's doing right now with the small arms training over there. So, if you got a question, uh, a good number of us can actually give you the, the no. BS answer as to why something is, why something is not. Uh, so go use it. It's a it's a good resource. It's at lethalityranch.com. Um, brand new. Posted up on New Year's Eve, or Christmas Eve. Uh, we've got some articles uh, in the pipeline. Uh, so nothing really there yet. Uh, we've also got a closed group on Facebook. Uh, so go ahead over there, Lethality Ranch Development, and um, take a peek. Join the conversation. Thank you. Cool. Mike Lewis. Uh, Mike Lewis, thanks for having me back yet again, Matt, even though I'm grumpy usually. I'm going to try not to be grumpy tonight. Uh, <laughs> but Mike Lewis, 20 years, Army Infantry, had a really cool job when I retired. And uh, long story short, the, the catalyst for me and Ian coming to you with this is training, training development, trainer development, talent development, whatever. It, it's over a matter of years became a passion in the Army, transitioned from the Army, was fortunate enough to remain in contact with guys that, that allowed me to continue assisting. Um, <clears throat> Came Break Consulting Services, LLC, uh, where I'm, I'm, my focus is absolutely training and education and leader development. Uh, the, the individual end user is great but the individual end user in an organizational uh, in an organizational format is not my focus. My focus there would be leader development because it's it's on it's incumbent on the leaders of the organization to develop their individuals. Uh, bringing somebody else in to develop their in individuals robs both the the lower level guys, lower ranking guys rather, as well as it robs the leaders of that experience. So do that. Uh, also working some, some product development with both material solutions and training aids. So doing a lot of things and hopefully just trying to help out and trying to, to improve the foxhole. And Dave. Who is muted? Hi, I'm Dave. <laughs> I work in uh, training development, um, and all my opinions are my own tonight. That's all? Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll leave it at that. And uh, Mike. Yeah, Mike Heiser. Uh, I'm an instructor and a consultant at Private, um, focusing primarily on human performance. And I'm just here to jump in where uh, I can help out. And the conversations we've had over, I don't know how many years now about human performance have been some of my favorites. And they've also provided some wonderful foundations for various uh, discussions online, podcasts and whatnot. So yeah, having you here is, it's, it's nice. 
And lastly, the Colonel. Yep, always keep, always keep the officer last. Um, so, hey, my, first of all, Matt, thanks for having me on. It's uh, I know it's been a long time coming, but uh, I'm definitely humbled to be here with the rest of you. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, Colonel Anthony Judge, uh, current, current active duty uh, Colonel Infantry Officer here at Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, com- uh, my background basically is typical of most infantry officers at my grade that commanded at all levels uh, in the infantry, of course, been deployed everywhere the Army asked me to go. Um, most recently was the brigade commander for the 199th Infantry Brigade here at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, responsible for the training of officer of the officer and NCO leadership of the, ar- of the infantry and armor branches. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we're about to talk about here, especially as, as it relates to instructor issues, of course, I dealt with pretty intimately over the last couple of years. Um, currently, the director for the TRADOC Capability Management Office for the SFABs, for the Security Force Assistance Brigades, uh, as we are still in the process of building those organizations, uh, currently at about 50% strength, three active brigades, and three in the build process right now. So uh, anyway, that's, that's a little bit about me. Uh, again, I'm, I'm glad to be here and happy to assist in, uh, in this process. Good stuff. So I'm thinking it probably would make the most sense for us to discuss what the baseline is of this. And obviously, it's how do we figure out who, who's an instructor? Who's optimally an instructor? What are, these, what are these traits that you guys find to be desirable in an instructor? And then we can move on to how to de- further develop techniques and whatnot. So any of you guys want, that want to start out, take it. Well, the law enforcement realm, I don't know. I'm going to ask you to fill that in, Matt. Uh, the military realm, if you look at doctrine, um, <clears throat> Long story short, Dave, Ian, and I are, or we are uh, somewhere between knee and hip deep, in, hip deep in doctrine on a regular basis. Part of it's because we're nerds, and part of it's because that's what we do. Um, I just recently finished a graduate certificate program in adult education, and one of my one of my papers was looking at the Army non commissioned officer corps. I found within an hour no less than seven doctrinal publications that in different words, in different statements, said the primary responsibility of the non-commissioned officer is to train soldiers. So according to the United States Army, everyone who wears stripes, well, a quantity of three stripes or two stripes, I'm sorry, corporals count two, two stripes or more, you are a trainer in the eyes of the United States Army. Um, the civilian world's a lot different. It depends on what realm you're in. If you're in the firearms realm, hey, I'm going to be a trainer. There is no true certification process to say I'm a firearms trainer. Uh, most people, unless they have heavy backgrounds in, in military and law enforcement, go through the NRA trainer course but there is no true accrediting agency. And I will say that that is both a, a positive and a negative. And, and it depends on what we're talking about and how we're talking about it, but that's both a positive and a negative. And in the corporate world, couldn't tell you. Don't know the corporate world to know what a trainer is out there. What would you say a trainer is in a law enforcement capacity, Matt? Well, as, as far as law enforcement and my experience working for a couple different agencies, everything from little tiny agencies to larger statewide. Um, it depends because there's not one specific answer saying this is it. Sometimes they're chosen because they have a desire, a passion, experience, and they're good at what they do. Then we have those that are selected because they happen to be at the right place at the right time. And it might not be the right place and it might not be the right time, but they're selected because you know what? We have this opening and you're going to take this. Um, and also at, at, in, in certain positions, certain positions do require. So with firearms in certain agencies, you don't necessarily have to be the best shot. You just have to, you just have to uh, conduct basic training on occasion and qualifications. So the answer to that is all over the map because there's not one, this is it. Uh, and, for, and unfortunately, 
that's that's the case there for firearms specifically there are uh, state academy not necessarily academy there's state um certifications post. but there, there's post but there's n at least in utah there's nothing beyond that you take that okay i, I went through that in 04 and basically they said okay yeah this is this is a gun go and do all these drills okay now now teach us something okay you're an instructor that's about it nothing so nothing gonna, to maintain so hang on a second so part of the problem is post from state to state is different mm -hmm. and within each agency or department the um yearly requirements based on um state post for continuing continuing education vary so a sheriff's department in one part of the state may have different um, protocols and requirements than a police department in another part of the state so there's no true as mike lewis was talking about there's no true standardization in law enforcement which is again can be a benefit but in most instances it's a an obstacle for um excellence um you know from what i'm hearing the military has more prescribed um scripted uh set of requirements that people have to go through in order to be certified to do and teach certain things we don't have that in law enforcement which is like i said it can be an, it can be an advantage i mean i've i've done some stuff at small departments and they were all on board and they were all ears and they were taking notes and i've been to huge departments and they were all soup sandwiches so it's just it's you have to find workarounds to some of the things that you run into as an instructor in le so it, it is it is true as mike was saying there is no true or legitimate um uh standard that can apply to law enforcement there's some basic concepts that people apply but there's no across the board universal um requirement for certification in the united states other countries do have that because they have legitimate state police agencies you look at france you look at spain those are good examples but here we don't have that yeah yeah um at the same time unless an agency or people that are in the know or decision makers are in the know and know this this is what a normal standard is or these are the trends that are that are happening right now the agency may be just doing 20 year old 30 year old quals and techniques and no one knows any better because no one cares and unfortunately that's the case in many instances and that kind of ties into the whole training thing that i want to do next not um, that we are doing next year uh, to help inspire and help to kind of change some of those trends so i would say passion right that, that, I would say passion gets your foot in the door. Um, I know, I know here in this state that we're that we're in over uh, in Georgia. I know that the the public safety place here has they have instructor courses because we've we've gone and shot with them and we've conducted some low light stuff, uh, trying to get a more robust part of that program working working over here. Um, but I, I, that's that's all I know based off of just our interaction, trying to build a relationship with those guys and then the, the ICE guys who are here. Um, I'm, I would honestly say that 100% like passion gets your foot in the door. Like if you're sent to me with just orders, you know I mean, I'm, I'm going to look at that. I'm going to take you as you are. There are guys that can perform by doing their job. You know, there's guys that'd be like, hey, I got sent here. I'm going to give you my 100%. That's just work ethic. Um, the second thing is let's, I, there's levels of passion, right? If you're passionate about shooting, that's great. But what happens when you got to be on the line and you can't shoot? Now you got to watch somebody else shoot, and now you got to get them to the level where they need to be. So now it's you're not you're not here to shoot. You're here to teach. You know, so so you have to you have to have the passion for it, and that's the job. What is the job? You got to describe the job, and you got to define the job. Um, that gets your foot in the door. Uh, what I did, um, what I did when, when I was a senior instructor was I, I made everybody get online and take that 13 personalities test. You know, um, one of the things that I know is I'm not, I'm not the best communicator. I'm like, here, here it is, do it. You know what I mean? And I expect an instructor to, you know, if you're here, I trust you to wake up, do the right thing. You're here for a reason. You're certified, you know, people three levels higher than me expect you to, you know what you do. And they signed off saying, you know what you did. Um, it worked for me as, you know, as an instructor somewhere else. Um, so I, I took that and I internalized it and I said, Hey, you know what, here's your left and right limit. Go, go forth and do good things. And 
you got to be careful because <laughs> again, that uh, you'll either get you'll either get good results and bad results, and that's where the kernel is right. We just got got to trust but verify. So one of the things I'll talk about uh, from my perspective on instructors is, um, you know, I'm I'm not convinced that, you know, having seen it from my level that we that we have it right. I think we have, you know, I always I've said this a bunch of times. We've got really good people on the trade off side. We have really good people, but I would argue we don't necessarily have the right people. And what do I mean by that? Is you know, our instructors come to us from HRC. They come to us from orders. They come to us from units where guys have been in command positions and then they're handed a set of orders and they said, okay, hey, you've done your time as a squad leader. You've done your time as a platoon sergeant. You've done your time as a first sergeant. Time to go do something else. Uh, so that's something else. That broadening experience uh, a lot of times comes in the, you know, as a drill sergeant or as a instructor at, at the infantry officer basic course. Um, or that, uh, or that correct, correct, I, I just dated myself, it's correction, that's the infantry officer basic leader course. Um, and so we get guys that are qualified, that have the requisite skills because their career path have, have led them, you know, to develop at least the minimum skill set required. But that doesn't make them good, that doesn't make them, because they have the experiences and they have the skills, that doesn't make them necessarily the right person to instruct. You know, we've all heard the, the, the saying, you know, those that cannot do teach, um, that's not necessarily true. I have plenty of those who cannot do that are really amazing instructors, have plenty of those who can do and are really horrible instructors because they just don't have the characteristics that we're going to talk about in this forum um, that, are pre that should be prerequisites of somebody that we're going to put out in front of the sons and daughters of America. and hold them to a standard of training those our sons and daughters to be ready for what we're going to ask them to do. So I, I'm not quite sure we get it right. Like I said, I, I think we got, we do have really good people and I, I you know, I, I would put my own son out there in front of those people, um, you know, and, and trust them to train them and prepare them. But I think we could do a better job. Sir, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to come back to your, if you, if those who can't do teach, that is a great example. Um, if we look 50 years ago this year, we went to the moon. We went to the moon based on people's advice who had never been to the moon. That's because nobody had ever done it. But the, the skills and the knowledge that most of this panel tonight is discussing, we're, we're not talking about things that people haven't done we're not talking about things that the instructors should not have ever done. Now, granted, there are some physical attributes. People get broken in our line of work. And there are some physical attributes that the physical things, if you can't do it, you can't do it. Your body just won't work that way anymore due to injuries, age, whatever, what have you. But I personally believe that those who are teaching a skill that cannot execute that skill have no credibility you have to at least know it and be able to do it. And th this goes into Bloom's taxonomy, which once I read that, it was like pff, mind blown. Bloom's taxonomy, you know, you, you can, you can regurgitate the levels, eh, whatever. You can regurgitate, you can do, and then at a point you can articulate, and then you can synthesize new information and blah, 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 blah. But if you don't know how to do it, how can you articulate how to do it. So anybody that's telling you those who can't do teach, they're full of shit. Yeah, I totally agree with you, uh, Mike. The uh, what I was getting at though is there are some based upon exactly what you said. You know, you got I've got guys that come here on the trade ox side that are that come to me broken, right? Um, but I can put them and they can teach doctrine as the day is long because you know, they don't, there's nothing really a whole lot to execute in doctrine. Now, if, if I'm going to put them out in front of a ranger platoon at fourth RTB, that's a whole different story. You know, or if we're going to put them as a, you know, instructor or an eyeballic, 
Absolutely. They've got to be able to shoot, move, and communicate, man. They've got to be able to do everything that, that those young, impressionable leaders, you know, need to see. Um, so I'm 100% with you. I, I think my point was not all that can do or not, not all that are come to me functional or capable are good instructors. You know, I mean, I've had many times where I've stood there in front of, you know, listen, you know, as a, as a brigade commander on the sideline, watching guys teach classes. And, and I, and the guy's got every badge known to man. He's been to combat. He's done, been there, done that guy, the t-shirt. It's a highly credible individual. Uh, but he just sucks at delivering the message, you know, and he can't hold the audience and he can't get the point across. And at the end of the day, that's the, the, you know, the, the students don't learn, you know, it's because they just don't have that ability. And I think as we talk about how do we select instructors, there's got to be a process. We've got to take it. You know, the Marine Corps, to, they take the educational side of, of their army, the, you know, the, the training base much more seriously than we do. And they put their money where their mouth is. They send their people to, you know, courses to teach them how to teach. And that's something we've got to learn from. We've got to learn from our, our fellow branches, and we've got to get better. Um, we're still producing good – we're producing a highly quali quality soldier. There's no doubt in my mind we're doing that. But imagine if we put our money where our mouth is, what we really, you know, how much we can improve even that on that. You know, we could have even that much better of a soldier um, if we had the right instructors out in front of them. Ian, how does the INTJ fit into this? So, uh, brought up uh, maybe a year or two ago now, uh, one of my coworkers um, in, the, in, the, in the National Guard we were kicking around this idea of how to filter uh, this very topic that we're talking about right now, how to select, how to filter um, instructors. And uh, we went over and took, uh, what is it, the Myers-Briggs, the Brig myers personality test. And um, uh, we had some interesting results in that I had the same result as Mike Lewis, as a few others, like a whole handful of us came out exactly the same way. Um, my letters were ENTJ, extrovert, intuitive, thinking, judging, because I like to judge people. Uh, Mikey over there, he took it twice and came out, what, INTJ, introverted, and everything else the same. But anyway, so personality inventories, uh, uh, how they perform in front of an audience, can they deliver a message, uh, is the message received? Uh, so, big, I mean, Aside from assessing an instructor in front of a group, sometimes you just don't know what you're going to get. Um, and, and really, the greatest assessment you can make is whether or not the audience uh, picked up the skill set or the knowledge that's trying to be transferred. So that's how I would evaluate an instructor uh, after the fact, up front. You just don't know what you're going to get sometimes. Um, passion will get you in the door. Like uh, I forget which one of you was saying that. Maybe Mike was saying that or, or Dave. But I'll also say passion keeps you in the arena when, when you're cold and tired and you've had, and, and you're at burnout, like we're talking about, uh, passion will keep you in it. So uh, maybe, maybe when you do hit that wall, you've got to cycle out to different aspects of the training, uh, of the schoolhouse, of, of something, uh, a related field. But, you know, that's a whole other discussion. So uh, anyway, INTJ, personality inventories, um, can they project, can they hold uh, attention, you know, all sorts of things. Um, I don't know. I'm just a dumb dumb. You know, I know. So no. I, at I least he's honest. Absolutely do it. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I think you should absolutely do the the inventory because it's important. It's going to allow you to communicate better with your your people, and it's going to allow you to basically put keep them away from jobs that they probably wouldn't be good at to begin with, and you can start developing that counseling to start you know, inoculating them into that spot so that they can start working on that as a strength and a weakness. But yep. at the end of the day, it's still, you're still going to be attacking something that you consider a weakness and something that they in X amount of years have failed to face and overcome. So be, be ready for the pushback. So talent you know, management's a huge part. Dave, Dave hit it on the head and, uh, uh, some people will take it as an attack on them, like they're not, not up to snuff. But the reality is it's not being up to snuff. It's, it's whether or not you're a good match for 
your position, no matter what position we're talking about. So some people will take it personally as an attack. Um, when in fact you, we're doing them a favor by maybe shipping them somewhere else, uh, in, in a, in a place where they have a better fit. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Talent management's a thing, uh, how to select for it. I'm babbling. I'm coming off. No, you're ex so I, I'd like to reinforce that talent management is exactly, uh, the answer. I mean, we, and it starts at the individual, at the unit level, when at every grade, when we start counseling soldiers and we start developing and we start assessing our people from the very first day, they show up to the organization and find out what their skill sets really are. What are their strengths and weaknesses? And then we start developing them. And that's one of the biggest problems we have across our army. And I'm sure it's the same in the police force. And it's the same across as we talk a big game about investing in our people, about our people being our business, but we do not spend enough time mentoring our people. If you know, go look at any units, counseling packets, anywhere in the army, any, in any unit, I would challenge that. I would challenge any organization to look at, at all levels and you'll, you'll see glaring deficiencies. And, and that's the reason I get instructors who are not that are good people, but are not great instructors because they just don't have those skills. You know, look at NCO. I read every NCOER and every OER for everybody that came to this organization looking for someone to tell me about how good of an instructor or how good of a teacher or how good of a, you know, a mentor or a counselor that these guys are. And it's just not, it's not reflected. I mean, they're all technically and tactically competent. They all walk on water and turn it into wine on the far side. They're all the best thing, you know, best person you could ever have, but nobody tells me about their core competencies. Um, that's, that's, that's because counseling isn't one of them. Right. Like they, it's, it's, it's nowhere. There's like, hey, there's, there's no strength and weakness chart. Sometimes we'll get somebody that actually conducted a 360-degree assessment. That's like the, the, the leader, peer, and subordinate like evaluation of you. But even then, it, it's, they get to pick who, who actually like, hey, uh, you're a good leader that liked me. Give me some feedback. It's just like, no. Get the good, the bad, and the ugly. Own it. And, you know, Ian said, maybe we're doing the guy a favor by shipping him somewhere else. We got to look at that through a different lens. It's not about doing that individual a favor because military and law enforcement, we both have mission sets where we send people into dangerous situations. And we're not doing that individual a favor by saying, hey, maybe uh, you're, you're great at what you do, but maybe you would be better suited for that job over there. We need to look at this as the people who are going to be in their charge during the time that they're in that position, because if they're not well suited for that, then they are going to, they're going to perform at less than an optimal level. And they're trying to pass instruction to people who are, who we are by nature going to be sending into dangerous situations. We have to look at the second and third order effects and not worry about doing that individual a favor but look at the mothers and the fathers that have given people or given their children to us. I concur wholeheartedly, Mike. Um, uh, in, in fact, uh, yeah, it's a responsibility that a lot of people just don't understand uh, or, or choose to confront and devote the amount of time required to uh, shoulder that burden and, and hone their skill and their craft. I learned the hard way during my first deployment that, I was woefully unprepared for all this stuff. Um, and, and I don't know if it's a matter of the process that created me and, and like sent me over there or, or if I screwed something up along the way. But, but in the end, it, it takes someone to uh, uh, own their gaps and, and pursue filling them in. And you know, whether that means going to APD and downloading all the free docs you can devour or, or, or picking people's brains, I, I don't know. But but um, you're absolutely right, uh, Mike. Uh, it's it's you know it's kind of like when you talk about uh, uh, some some someone maintaining their gun or 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 whether or not they're putting enough reps in for whatever whatever drill we're doing. And um, you know I, I, I get mad at people when I see them dicking around, sorry, uh, messing around and, and not keeping the weapons up to snuff because look, that's not your gun. That's my gun. That's the guy next to you's gun. That's the guy behind you gun. It, it's it's it belongs to the family of the guy that you're protecting. So in, in the same way, um, uh, you own your instructional capability, 
uh, goes beyond whether uh, you're a good fit for it. It goes to whether or not you're going to get someone home. I, I agree completely, Mike. I have a question for you guys then. Um, on the law enforcement side, there can be kind of almost a click or like cool guy points for being an instructor. For some reason, there definitely is on the, in the gun industry side, some kind of weird fanboy, whatever craze about, yeah, I'm a firearms instructor, cool guy thing. It's, is, that, is there that same type of a mentality on the military side? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was Two letters, bravo and four. It, what puzzles me is that seems to be so, it's polar opposite of what I want to do. I want to help. I want to teach. I want to ensure the people that I work with or the people that I'm teaching have the skills and the, the, the abilities that they need to do their jobs. And if there's the, if there's that, time where they're going to need to use deadly force. I want to ensure that they're going to be able to do that judiciously and legally and effectively and get out alive. So I, I, so I say that I'm going to put it into context. There's a difference between somebody that teaches that is a renter or an owner, right? Somebody that comes in and rents the space, wants the cool guy gear. They don't want to do the hard work to be in the heat to teach the small stuff, to do the prep work before. You know what I mean, for instance, I was in a room with a guy who actually thought that I was making him do bitch work because I said, go inventory the supply locker for the next class. And I didn't even know how to respond for that. I was like, you're an instructor here. Why wouldn't you want to do that? But it's, it's just not cool. I want to. I want to be the cool guy in the smoking area, having a cigarette, while everybody else is sweating and everything like that. When I just, I, I have all the answers. You just need to ask me all the questions. You want to be that sage on the stage instead of that guy next to you, figuring it out, right? Or or playing with their food, like Ian likes to say. I'm going to give you a concept and I'm going to let you play with it, right? I'm going to let you figure it out. I'm going to let you develop that process based off of this principle so that you can start employing it the right way in situations as they presented. I'm not going to be, hey, you're doing it this way because I said so. You don't need to know why you're doing it. You're just doing it. That's, that's just a lack of, uh, I would say, if, if you do that, it's, it's a lack of emotional intelligence, right? You're not understanding that what you do contributes, contributes to, the, to the greater picture, right? And as an instructor, you, you, you have to understand that every, every morning when you wake up, like, uh, you have to understand, like, you're doing this for someone else, right? Um, and that's what your product is. If, if, that, if you're graduating someone that can achieve what your core scope is supposed to be, but you're signing off on a certificate anyway, you just put the credibility of the entire course on the line, you put your integrity on the line, and you put your ability to actually project power and influence across across anywhere on the line just just plain and simple and that's that's the most destructive thing you can do uh the the second the second most the second interesting thing about that stuff and this is again my, my opinion is somebody doesn't always have to do something wrong for them to be a bad fit it doesn't always have to be a negative thing to be like hey you know what this just isn't the right place for you you've been here too long we're making some changes because the army keeps rolling along or the law enforcement area is changing, right? You guys, your guys' legalities change all over the place. And if you just got somebody who doesn't want to change, who doesn't want to agree with it, and you have somebody that says, hey, you know what? We're, we got these guys that are just stuck. They don't want to do anything. And, and he asks you, hey, you, you got to, these guys will probably be better served somewhere else. You got to do it. You got to do it. If you, if you say that you trust a guy and you put him in that position, and he's telling you what he needs to do, you, you, you got to listen to that guy. And this isn't against the, the, um, the Bravo four guys, just uh, the, usually the ego goes up, the more specialized you are. It's just natural. I think everybody will agree with that. Um, and it's just something that, uh, that I know is stuck with me. And you, you got to be able to learn from your failures more than your successes. 
So, so uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Ian. The, um, I, I think the root of all this is that a lot of folks don't actually understand the breadth and depth of what's required or, or what the term trainer truly encompasses. Everything from owning the training space to, to prepping the space to your rehearsals to verifying that that electrical outlet has power in it to support your, you know, your, your, your gizmo. Um, being able to speak to your bosses about, uh, about the performance of your course, being able to speak your boss's language uh, so you can keep funding coming so that you can sell it to others and get more asses in seats. Whether it, I mean, it, it, it covers so many things that people don't truly understand what being a trainer is. I had, I had one of our guys say recently, um, uh, you know, I don't know about that. I just know how to put uh, bullets on target. Well, that's the wrong answer because you should know how to do all these other things. You should know how to do a report, how to do an AAR after action review. You should know where uh, to find the TNE uh, training and evaluation outlines. You need to know all these other ancillary aspects to instructing, not just putting a bullet where you want it to go, but how to also develop periods of instruction, how to do a stair step process to, uh, to, to teach a, 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 a terminal learning objective. Uh, it, it, it involves so much more than even just getting in front of someone and, and showing them how to do a mechanical action uh, that I think that, 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 that gap, that, that, that ignorance gap is preventing people from truly assessing where they are in, in their instructor development or the trainer development cycle. They just, they just don't know what they don't know, unfortunately. And, you know, there's no reason why they shouldn't know. Tradoc has all sorts of PAMs. Uh, freaking, you know, start with flipping FM70. If, if you're not ripping this thing apart, highlighting it, marking it all up, uh, you're, you're, you're probably wrong. If you don't know what the step uh, training model is, if you don't know uh, what your responsibilities in terms of top down and bottom up are, these are all things. <laughs> we, we, we're, we're, we're doctrine nerds. We're, we're, we're reading nerds. And if you're not, you're, you're, you're not fully dimension. You don't have every dimension that's needed. So it requires knowledge. It requires attributes. It requires experience to do all these things. And I, I just don't think. Yeah. I'm yeah. sunsetting. I'm like an old man now. So your turn. You know, Ian, I'm going to raise a pretty big gripe here. I know the airing of grievances was last week, Matt, but we keep saying trainer, 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 trainer. Dave, Ian, you both know where I'm going. Words have meaning. Words mean things. We say trainer. And it, it, the, the, the common vernacular is trainer. But what we're really talking here is training and education. There is a big difference. Training and education, I can't remember the exact textbook definition of the two, but when we're talking training, we're, we're basically talking response to stimulus. If A, then B. This is what you do. And when we do that, we're talking rote learning. If A, then B. And when we're, it, we're, we're not really solving any problem when we do rote learning. If A, then B. Education is the cognitive side of it. There is a place for training, absolutely, but there's also education, and this is as simple as rifle employment. TC 3-22.9, which the three of us were heavily involved in, it describes under the control element of the shot process, head nod or head shake. Does it, does it or does it not say that the individual is the ballistic computer for the rifle? If it's if if the if the shooter is the ballistic computer for the rifle in the fight, then that shooter has to have at least a baseline and understanding of internal external terminal ballistics. And what I'm looking at really here is external ballistics. Okay, I'm zeroed for 300 meters, but that's uh, that dude's at about 200. Do I need to use a hold or do I consider an aim center mass? Well, most people are going to say aim center of mass. Well, no because the trajectory of that bullet, it hit max ordinate on a 300 meter zero, somewhere about 180 meters. And it's still close to the max ordinate. So if all I have presented is a head, and I take a shot center mass of the head because that's what's presented, I just missed. 
because I did not have the cognitive side of the education to go with my training. And when we, when we think training, 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 but we don't do the education piece, even though that's a the very oversimplified example, we're failing people when we don't include both. Yeah, we can put people through drills all day, but if they don't understand it, why did we waste our time? Yeah. yeah well, I, will tell you, one drill. I will tell you one of the things that we had kicked around even here with my guys was the word and words do have meaning. I agree with all of you on that is, you know, the term instructor versus teacher, you know, is a, is a, completely different has a different meaning to certain to different people you know to instruct a lesson you know is a very specific thing with a specific outcome with you know certain task conditions and standards that need to be that need to be taught to them it doesn't go above and beyond the lesson plan and you know we must you know get past that mindset and i agree with we agree with what mike was saying is it's about education. It's not about instructing. It's about teaching them to think versus react. You know, yeah, I can teach battle drills all day long, you know, where you can, you know, you can in your sleep do that shit. And we want that. But I also want people to be able to think outside the box. I want them to be able to make sure that, you know, they outmaneuver the enemy and they're not reacting to the enemy. Um, and so a lot of that comes with, again, training our instructors appropriately so that they have the appropriate skill sets to deliver that information appropriately uh, or effectively. Um, you know, some of the things you were talking about, and I know, uh, I think it was uh, Dave brought up emotional intelligence. You know, there's a lot of things it, it, the, when you select these guys and we start talking about characteristics of what are we looking for when we look at a good, when we're looking for a good instructor, a good teacher. Um, you know, we we always start out. You know, does he is he technically and tactically competent? Well, I hope so. You know, if he's got that rank on his shoulder, I, I hope he's technically and tactically competent for his level. Um, is he intelligent? Okay, that's a broad that's a broad uh, assessment. It depends what you mean by it. You know, is he educated versus street smart? You know, intelligence can go a, a variety of different ways. Um, but I think what, what Dave brought up was emotional intelligence, I think is critical. Does he understand, can he, can he relate with his people? Um, is he empathetic? Can he read the needs of his audience? You know, instead of just getting up there on the stage, and I think we've all been guilty of it, I know I have, getting up on the stage and talking to a, a, an audience and the message that you're delivering is not resonating. But you stick to the message because that's what you trained, that's what you planned for. You know, that's what you rehearsed. You know, and I see, I see that a lot in a lot of our instructors in the Army as we say, hey, go out here and we'll use Airborne School for an example. It's one of the finest uh, training institutions we have here at Fort Benning. Um, but you go to some of those black hats and some of that stuff is absolutely memorized, you know. And that's great if they get it, if they get it the first time. But if they start asking hard questions, can your instructors actually get beyond the, mem the route memorization? Do they, do they know it themselves so that they can teach it? Not just, not just, uh, you know, not just a spout, not just blurt it out. Um, so I think they've got to have that level of, of connection with their, with their people. Um, I agree. Passion gets you in the door. Um, but we got to keep them somehow as leadership. We got to keep those guys motivated. We got to keep them invested in being a quality instructor. Yes, drill sergeants and ranger instructors, absolutely. I see the notes, the comments coming in. Um, that's why I said one of the great institutions on Fort Benning, not the great institution when I was talking about Airborne School. Um, but we've got to do a better job as, as leadership of making sure that we keep our people motivated. You know, what are the incentives to keep them in the process? To keep them wanting to come back to be instructors, teachers, coaches, mentors. How do we do that? Because uh, if we don't, we lose them. We get a one-time guy, we teach them, and then they're gone. And then we have to do the whole process over and over again. Um, but we got to keep them committed to teaching and committed to training and preparing our sons and daughters, uh, as Mike was getting to, 
you know, because I will tell you, I, I every single day, I got a, a I got an, an eight year old son who's already telling me much to my chagrin as an infantryman that he wants to be a tanker. Um, and so he's going to be here someday and he's going to be out in front of one of these young officers that my people have taught. And, you know, the true test of, of, uh, you know, the true test, the true proof, proof, in, you know, proof, uh, of how we taught that guy is going to be what he delivers to my son. And I think about that all the time. Um, so we've got to do, you know, I think there's a, there's a burden on leadership to make sure that we do the right things. We have the right, the right, um, we select the right people and then we have the right training for those people to make sure that we prepare them. And then in the long run, we make what they did worthwhile. We make it not only personally rewarding, but we make it career enhancing. And then we'll get the right people. Sign me up. That, that critical thinking skill set uh, that the Colonel kind of referred to there is uh, severely lacking in, in an age when people merely read slides and, and get into that um, transmission of information as opposed to interacting and, and assessing your audience and knowing what gaps they have to, to mold to that audience. So uh, unless folks can uh, conceptualize and synthesize and analyze and and um, uh, apply all, all these things in, in a fluid, flexible uh, environment, uh, we're just not gonna get there. And, um, and um, I like ice cream, I don't know. So a couple weeks ago, I did a uh, podcast with a great panel and we discussed helping new shooters. And John Johnston of Ballistic Radio had this wonderful explanation of, optimally teaching kind of the idea was the ability to teach something from multiple angles so if your first explanation doesn't work okay i'm going to attack it from this angle now okay that doesn't work let's go this way and to me that just says that, that that's understanding that is understanding the basic principles of what's being taught and that's mastery if, if I'm able to teach the exact same thing, we're getting the same results, but we're going to go through these different routes to get there. That's, that's a good instructor. See, that's a matter of, of understanding your learners. We've got different types of learners. We've got different domains of learning, different types of learners. Generally, you've got your, your kinesthetic hands-on. You've got your visual. You've got your auditory. And a properly built lesson plan will include elements of all three. It won't just be a lecture. And that that's something that all of us have seen. And like the Colonel was saying, you sit, you sit in a room, a guy gives you the same brief that he gave you three months ago, hunt the good stuff. He reads from a slide and nobody in the audience is listening. Nobody in the audience cares because it's the same stuff they heard three months ago. There, there's no visual aids. There's no discussion. There's no hands-on. You're not turning your students. You're, you're not forcing your students to think and apply. And then we get into the domains of learning, which are effective cognitive and psychomotor. And, and Dave and I had a, a conversation earlier today about that. Um, you should also be applying the domains of learning in your lesson plan and you should be doing it all at one time to where it's, it's almost a seamless transition to where the learner doesn't see, Oh, okay. Now I've got a graphic training aid. Oh, now it's hands on. It's more. And this, this comes from the first instructor course that I took on, on the industry. Um, Troy price formerly instructing with LMS defense. I think he's still involved, but Troy gave me this great little acronym called EDIP. And it's stuck with me since. It's explain, or explain, demonstrate, imitate, practice. So you explain what's going to be going on. It may be a by the numbers where you're demonstrating simultaneously. I'm going to give you the, uh, 
okay, somebody gave a comment, edge, explain, demonstrate, guide, enable. This is pretty much the same thing. I'm going to explain the, the, the thing that you're going to do and demonstrate what you're going to do. Now I'm going to have you imitate it or guide you through it. And then, okay, you've got this, go do it. And they have to go apply it on their own. And that, that's what we're getting at here. Uh, Dave, I think you've probably got something to add there. Yeah, so when we're talking about the mill side, and this is more training development, okay, this is, this is where, again, the systems and processes are what's going to create your culture, right? That's, that ultimately, that's what we're trying to do, right? If, if, if we're trying to create a culture of training management, then okay, then get down to it. Every lesson plan has every cognitive level of learning in it. In the military, I know in the mill side, every lesson plan is built off the experiential learning model. It has every mode of learning in there. It attaches everything to it. If all you read is the lesson plan and you just get the information that's based out of it, I'm sure you're totally missing sections that have like, hey, this is what task this is derived from. Hey, this is what reference to look at in a book for more of an explanation on this. There's even practical exercises that are attached to it, and you can go to a facility to get training aids for it, or you can make your own. Um, and, and all that stuff is, is allowed. What I love about the mill side of it is that no matter how, no matter how, you know, we all have our like, oh, this could be better, this could be that. There's not a single thing in the Army that's not written down that you can do. If you want to do anything, in the army, it's written down somewhere and there's somebody that can teach it. And there's a lesson plan for it. And it's all in a database and it's all readily available. Um, if we're talking about how, how to best inform someone of doing something, then yeah, absolutely, right? If we're, if we're let's just talk about, there's, there's guys who can listen, there's guys that can read it, right? And there's guys that can like do it with their hands. If you if you're trying to do this for a living and put bread on the table, and you know that there's three different ways of doing things out there that people learn, and you want to maximize your ability to be able to get people like in the door, you need to come up with a way of doing something that's going to apply all three. That's just I don't know that, that that's just getting more people. That's saturating more more of a percentage of people, right? It's like um, uh, I think it was a wise business tactic. At, at least um the other thing is if if you don't know what you're doing you got you got you to gotta come up on the radar and ask if 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 you're not good at something or you're seeing a dip in your performance or a dip in your in someone coming in you, you got to have an external evaluation right um you got to have somebody to go in there and give you like the no bs like thing um i know what i did was I snuck this in there in a memo. Whenever I did a welcome letter to a memo, I always sent it to the, the 06 or the 05 or captain in charge, whoever their supervisor was. And I actually sent an email in a welcome letter and I made them give me the email to their, their supervisor who was in charge of their, either their battalion or their company. And what I would do six months after graduation on Excel is it would automatically generate a feedback, uh, a, a feedback survey. Be like, hey, did I give you the product that you need to do what you sent him here to do or her here to do, right? And it was it was something that hadn't been done before um, that that I saw, and I saw that it was a gap in the systems in the process. And and if you're in charge of a class or you're an instructor, first thing you have to do is you got to know your organization, you got to know the systems and processes that actually make it happen. If if you don't know, then that's the first problem you got to fix. Again, passion will get you in the door. But now you got to understand the processes and the, uh, the systems that actually make the place work so that you can actually work within a system to change it, modify it, or make it better. So what um, Mike and Dave are kind of digging into was uh, pushed out a while ago by a guy named uh, Howard Gardner at Harvard. He's part of the Zero Project group, and it talks about how people learn and what they're discussing basically is something called cognitive capture. If you're an instructor and you're not presenting a lesson plan in a certain way, they can't capture that information. They cannot uh, absorb what you're spitting out. Um, and then Mike mentioned earlier, the difference between an instructor and an educator. Um, I'm going to 
shift gears just a little bit. Um, I can tell you how to make an omelet, right? Or I can tell you how to place an ice screw. I can say, this is how you do it. But if I don't explain why it's necessary to place the ice screw in a position that seems counterintuitive to take a load off a whipper, right? You, you can place the ice screw, but do you understand why? Do you tap the ice? Do you look at the ice? You know, if, if I'm applying uh, temperature to an egg, I say, this is the way we do it, do it. But don't explain why, you know, roasting an egg versus shearing an egg with steam versus frying an egg. You will not understand anything about how to do anything past that very rote memorization skill set that you're being presented with. So when it comes to being a firearms instructor, you can get out there and you can say, hey, we're going to do, you know, two reload two, speed reload two. Are you explaining why that's necessary and how it's applicable in your future? You know, why is this, why is this an important skill set to have? I can say, this is how we do it. I'll demonstrate it. Now get out there and do it. But if I don't explain why that might be important or malfunction clearance drills or what, it doesn't matter what it is. If you don't give more than the bare minimum, you're doing something that uh, I, I consider unethical. Um, I've seen departments in LE where they place somebody in a position of firearms instructor because he's close to retirement or he's a pain in the ass of the department and they want to remove him from the, the rest of the department and park him at the range. And, and, and Mike was talking about this and, and the Colonel was talking about this. You're creating a liability that extends forever when you train that way. If that person doesn't give a shit, they don't have some passion and they don't have an understanding about what they're doing. Um, and, and they're just basically place marking or bookmarking until they retire. Or they were sent there because they're not good for anything else. You know, what they're teaching or what they're not teaching in certain instances is a liability. And that's a, that's a thing that carries on forever. I will not teach certain people. Because I don't want that liability to extend forth. I was at the academy one time teaching uh, uh, firearms block. And we had somebody in there who should not have been in the academy. And we did our pistol qual. And I refused to score the person's target. I said, I'm not doing it. Because that liability attaches to me. I said, if you want to pass that guy and get him to the academy for certain reasons, that's your job. It's not my liability. It's not my responsibility. I don't think you should pass him, but if you want to do that, that, that's on you. That's your onus. You have to own that for the rest of your life. So the education and instructional component, circling back, I can instruct you on something, but am I teaching you why it's important? As an instructor, if you don't understand the difference between those two things, you shouldn't be an instructor. Right? You should have a passion for it. And then Ian was talking about, and Mike, were Mike and Dave were talking about, you know, you have to do more than the bare minimum as an instructor. You know, you have to understand, get out there and do everything. Understand every component of what it requires to be an instructor. Do I like setting up targetry? Fuck no. But do I do it? Absolutely. You know why? It gives everybody a cognitive pause. I don't want my students setting up the targetry. I want them to chill, you know, load their magazines, get their lookies and chewies in, you know, talk to each other, compare notes. I'll do that work. I'll do the hard work so that when you're on the range, you're on the line or you're in the house, you're just focusing and practicing and executing what I've been instructing you and educating you on. I don't want you to have that cognitive load of, and that, physical load of setting up shit in 103 degree temperature and 90% humidity, I'll handle that. Or my AIs will handle that. Or the other people that can handle it can handle it. You're, you're inhibiting people's capability when you put something else extraneous upon them other than the task that, that's before them, which is to learn how to, you know, do shooting on the move 25 to the 15, you know, to the body, to the brain. So, Everybody's talking about, um, or everybody's jumping into, you know, the quality of uh, the instructor. Again, I, I go back. Sometimes departments and law enforcement or agencies, you know, you're saddled with, or the, the students are saddled with instructors that have no quality whatsoever. And so the question I, I posit to people, um, military is different than LE, but 
how do you get rid of somebody like that? I know how to do it, but how would you, as listeners, how would you approach that problem of, you know, shit canning some guy that's, uh, you know, uh, inhibiting the proper learning process and that's actually toxic? I yeah. a, oh, take it. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think our tools on the military side are a little bit different. Um, clearly, many opportunities, like I said, if you know, if you're doing it right, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Is you know, trust but verify. You know, you send your leadership around to go check in. I made my leadership go sit in on courses. You know, it's a part of evaluating your people. You know, I mean, it's part of you know when you're writing NCOERs and OERs and things like that evaluation reports, um, you know, how do you know how to evaluate your people as you actually sat down and watched them and listened to them and paid it, you know, and, you know, if they were teaching a course, you know, I, I would sit in, I mean, I would sit in the background, which I'm sure was no stress for that, that poor instructor, but when the brigade commander is sitting in the back of the room, but, you know, I had to gauge it for myself, you know, are we doing, do I have the right guy teaching the right way? Is he connecting with the people? Is the message he's delivering getting there? You know, and you can learn that just by listening to the questions that are asked by the students, you know? Um, and so when I ran into an instructor who was just obviously out of his, out of his league, you know, whether, and I, and I take that personal because if, you know, if I got a guy I put up in front of students, damn it, if that guy's not ready, and he's already up there, then, I, then we've made a mistake. And then we, that's on us. And we've got to correct that um, because the sons and daughters of America deserve better. And, and so, you know, it's, it's easier for me in the military. We have, like I said, we have the tools where I can reach out and I can pull that guy off the, off the stand. You know, I would, of course, wouldn't do it in front of the students, but, you know, at, at a point in time, I would pull him back and put somebody else in there until I can get that guy either trained or replaced, one of the two, um, just depending on what he had. Um, I like to, jump in on something you talked about earlier about when we were talking about not only how to train these, uh, our students, but one of the things to take into consideration is the gym. And most of you have probably heard this is generational learning. You know, it's, it's each generation learns differently. You learned differently, not only not talking about the cognitive way of learning, but each, you know, we grew up with PowerPoint. We grew up with, you know, a, a certain manner of instruction whether it was right or wrong, whether it worked for you or not is irrelevant, but that's kind of how it went. Um, you know, and if you ever listen to Lenny Wong, and I would encourage anybody out there, if you really are interested in, in understanding your students, get, go, go out there on, he's got a Ted talks and he's uh, you know, you can get him on YouTube and stuff like that. But, you know, he came and spoke to us at the war college, both when I was a major and a Colonel um, and talk to us about how to, how to reach the generations and what, you know, what is valued to them. So, you know, we're talking about millennials and what's important to a millennial and how do I reach millennials? Um, you know, the asking of why is like center, center mass of every lieutenant that comes through Fort Bend. Yeah, if we don't just teach them, hey, this is how you shoot, move, and communicate, this is we teach them, this is why you shoot, move, and communicate. Because um, if you don't, you're not going to get them. You're not going to reach them and they're not going to learn it. And then we're going to put them out in front of platoons and they're going to be incompetent and they're going to get people killed. Um, and then that falls back on us. And that's the kind of stuff that I lose sleep over is, you know, and that's why we have to have the right people when we have to make sure that if somebody's not producing, if they're not getting it done, then we do right by the student first and foremost. Um, and we get that instructor off the line. Sir, the why and Mike adding the why. Um, thank you both for that. Um, it, it, it comes back to, and, and He's a little bit controversial, Mike. I'm sure you, you'll have more on it than I will. But this comes back to Andrew Goji and Malcolm Knowles' theories of adult learning. And one of his six principles of the adult learner is, you'll find it stated different in different places, but you have to buy the learner's buy-in, for one. And part of getting the learner's buy-in is adult learners need to know why what you're teaching them is important. Absolutely. So if, if, if you don't know why it's important, why should you care? And it comes back to Dave and Ian, I know you're going to laugh because we've talked about it before. Basic training, 1995 for me. Hey, 150 meter target, aim low at 150 because bullets rise off the muzzle. Mm. 
bullets rise off the muzzle. There's no cognitive anything there, like we were talking about with the shooter being the ballistic computer for the rifle. Bullets rise off the muzzle. Well, no, they don't. It's not a magic floating jelly bean that defies the laws of gravity and physics. It, it rises off the muzzle because it's aimed at an upward angle to overcome that 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration towards the earth from the instant that it leaves the muzzle. Slight upward angle. That's why it flies in a parabolic arc through the air. But that wasn't explained to us. And our generation, like, like the colonel was saying, we took it at face value. Bullets rise off the muzzle, so aim low at 150 and 2. And we didn't tend to question why it rose off the muzzle and went high at 150, but then went exactly where we were aiming at 300 because generational, they spoke, you listened, roger that, I will do it. But adult learners, and especially with the younger generations, they have to know why it is important to learn what you're teaching them. And if you're not doing that, you're failing every person you're trying to teach. To add, to add on to that, the, the reason why is we're requiring more of people now. It's not, it's, it's not just it's like, do what I say, you know, do it, you're going to knock it out. We're actually requiring more of, more of actual people with the technology we give them, you know, along with the task we do them, with the rules that we're asking them to do it under. You know what I mean? Adding on to the actual conditions. Um, going back to uh, Matt, I honestly, I, if I was in charge of a guy who wasn't producing, like the easiest, the easiest, all of us can sit here and say, well, we'd fire him, right? But there's, there's also a, a, you know, what have we done to help the guy? You know, as, as leaders, that's, that's, you know, I mean, that's, that's the first question you should always ask. It's, it's always the question I ask. You know, if I'm in a position to put somebody, it's like saying, okay, something happened, something negative came out of it. I'm responsible. If I'm in charge, I'm ultimately responsible. And I have to deduce whether it was something that I did or something that I let happen or if it was a condition that existed because um, either they did something or I did something, right? You, you, always, you always have to figure it out. And you always got to start with it yourself um, if you're a leader. Um, and then if it, if it is you, you got to, again, systems and processes to fix it, you know, and if it comes to find out it was that person, they just had to disregard for, you know, safety or, or their position. Then, Hey, that's, that's, there's nobody that's going to sit, sit there as a leader and say, Hey, you're, you're not giving this guy the benefit of the doubt. Um, as, as far as what, uh, what Mike was just talking about here. Uh, no, man, you're absolutely right. We've had that conversation. I, I fully agree with you. 100%. So I'm going to play a little so, catch up here. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So really quickly, in the absence of leadership, so top down, if you have instructors in place and they're, they're not adequate and the leadership doesn't give a shit, and we're talking to the students out here that are listening, it's incumbent upon you to be proactive and find instruction someplace else. I know that can be a pain in the ass because that means you have to quit drinking your Starbucks and save money for your ammo and for lodging and travel and all that and, and seek a better level, right? Rising tides lift all ships. You have to go out there and do it on your own. You may be in a department or an agency in law enforcement and you're like, why am I here? What, what the hell is, what, what, what the hell did I just, I went through three days of pistol training. What the fuck was this? You, there, are, there are resources out there that you can use to find a better quality of instruction. And then when you come back to your department, you can do a little whispering in the ear of your fellow uh, officers, deputies, or whatever, and say, hey, you know, I went to this class out in North Carolina or, you know, California or whatever, and this is what this dude said about photonic barrier running under nods or whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. It's not, it's not important about the topic or the instructional block. It's that you found somebody that could inculcate you and teach you and give you the passion for understanding why it's important to do what you do. That's instruction versus education. So there are instances where you have people in positions of leadership that don't give a shit. And the instructors below them don't give a shit. They're just marking time. 
If you're a student, you have to do your own homework sometimes, and you have to do your own work and find the way and the means to go find instruction someplace else. Oh, and, and what, what, one more thing, what Mike Luce was talking about and what, what uh, Dave's kind of talking about also on something, another point is, if as an instructor, you're not using Socratic method heavily, you're not a good instructor. I gave a lecture someplace one time about how technology leverages the battle space. And these people were all, all upright in their uniforms, very formal instruction in a block. And I told the, the, the normal instructor, fuck off, you can't be in here. And I had these guys basically form a school circle, take their left boot off for certain reasons, and just you know sw switch places because they're sitting in alphabetical order. Made them very uncomfortable. And I threw leading questions and did a lot of Socratic stuff. And they got on board completely because they were engaged. They were outside their normal, very strictured environment. You know, they were rats. That'll be a clue. Um, and they were, when we were done after two hours, I said, I will be, I'm staying at this hotel. I'll meet you at this pizza place at 6 p.m., 1800. If you have any other questions, we can discuss it then. They all showed up. Because they made it engaging and enlightening and informing and entertaining. And they were all on board with trying to go beyond what we had in that instructional block. So if an inst as an instructor, if you're not using Socratic method, if you're not asking questions, hey, why do you think this, you know, offset is important at 15 meters when you're shooting brain shots? Well, I don't know. Well, why not? We've always been taught this way. Why? You know, you should be using these leading questions. You should be pulling the information out of them. You should be helping them learn to learn. If you're not doing that as an instructor, you're not a good instructor. So uh, working backwards, uh, concur completely. Uh, however, whatever you have to do to inculcate ownership of the educational process in the student, you gotta do it. So whether that is uh, getting them directly involved in conversation, so it's less uh, a monologue and, and transmission and more uh, interactive and uh, getting them involved. Having them think about what you're saying um, is important. Uh, someone mentioned earlier uh, the importance of relevance, uh, especially to the adult learner. Uh, unless they can actually see the applicability of something to their life uh, and, and their job and, and in what they do, they're just not going to engage the, the brain the way they should be. Uh, even when they uh, practice a mechanical uh, drill or action, uh, unless they truly understand the importance of it, you're never going to get that deep practice, that intentional practice. Um, and something that comes up a, a lot of times uh, in, in the Army, and I think a lot uh, of different branches as well, is uh, talking to folks about the importance of weapons training. So. Uh, you know, that's, that's what the majority of us do. So that's uh, an, uh, something I'll bring up. Um, so uh, more than one of us, I'm sure, has run into someone that said, well, we're not infantry. We don't need to know that stuff. We're transportation. We don't need to know that stuff. You know, uh, we, we don't leave the wire without infantry or the MPs for escort. Uh, but they just haven't been shown the relevance of, of the value of knowing machine guns. So... Um, the majority of machine guns are not in weapon squad. The majority of machine guns are not in infantry. The majority of machine guns are in flipping transportation companies. That's where your machine guns are. And when you're deployed out, uh, guess who will be drafted into supporting uh, log runs and convoys and up and down roads that we don't own anymore because you know that's just not what we do. We don't, we don't own our supply routes uh, apparently anymore. Uh, so guess what? Guess who's gonna be manning that machine gun? Who, guess who's responsible for base defense? All you fobbits, if anyone's ever called you a fobbit, you're on the line for uh, base defense. And base defense is machine guns. You, you've got to know machine guns. If you think you're an IT guy and it doesn't apply to you, you're out of your flipping mind. So um, uh, these are all aspects of, in one example, showing people the relevance of knowing machine guns. Um, another topic that was brought up was uh, the importance of giving people breaks, mental breaks, so that they can... Uh, have their licky chews and down some water. Uh, whole, completely agree. Uh, have, having that mental space is important for them to um, organize uh, and consolidate the information you just gave them. Um, and, and without that opportunity, uh, you don't let the brain catch up to 
everything that they've been given so far and they can't build upon it with the next block of instruction. But more importantly, so whenever I attend a, um, a block of training, civilian or military, uh, th there are three domains, three, three areas that I find value in learning. Uh, it's, and it's not just, uh, there's of course the drills, the techniques, the, the whatever you're there to learn. But also if you're paying attention, if you're a trainer uh, and you're not observing and learning from the way they deliver a block of instruction and the way they execute the course itself administratively or logistically, you're missing out on three whole different areas that that uh, you could be benefiting from. And, and even if I don't learn anything technique wise, I will learn something on how they hung a target or how they did student reception or how they did whatever. I will learn how the person in separately uh, uh, taught something. What words did he use? What technique did he, what, what stair step process did he use to get there? So it isn't just the content, it's the context, it's the delivery, it's the way they executed the course. All fantastic errors for them to observe you doing. So. I will take pride, I, I, I will use hanging targets as, uh, as a subliminal um, uh, Trojan horse on teaching them how to hang a target, or I will teach them how to properly receive students and deliver a block of instruction, or even just get the classroom set up. If they don't have faith that I know what I'm doing, then there's no reason for them to uh, replicate what I do. And they watch you, they're like kids, they're sponges. They watch everything that you're doing, and, and they, they will, if they hear you say something, but do something different, They'll do what you, they saw you do and not what you said. So getting that right is supremely important. And finally, reading my chicken scratching notes, um, uh, something about uh, uh, a problem that plagues uh, so-called instructors and trainers where they just deliver information, read off a slide, uh, and, and I'm kind of fighting this uh, a problem myself. And it's, it's the tendency for a lot of uh, folks in the military to ask others for a slide deck. Hey, who, who's got a slide deck for, you know, fill in the blank. And, and they take the easy way out because, you know, it's been said the highest form of military writing is plagiarism. And there's a degree of truth to that because why reinvent the will? But if you don't take the time, even if something is available readily to be borrowed and used for your own period of instruction, you're missing out on the opportunity to uh, solidify the information in your own head Organize information in, in a logical progression in the slide deck. Uh, you're not honing your ability to deliver that slide deck because now you know what slide is coming up next. You know how to do the transitions. Uh, you will own the information much more by developing your own slide decks or your own periods of instruction than you will ever get out of borrowing something and just reciting it. And that is what leads to a lot of problems we have today in the military that we're all observing about people just rote memorization, they're robots, uh, if something screws up their delivery, <laughs> I remember I was a young Lance Corporal, I started on the Marine Corps, young Lance Corporal uh, giving a briefing and I, I was shaking, I was nervous, I was sweating, I was scripted, uh, I got distracted, I lost my place. That, that's not training, that, that's, that's just a teleprompter. And if all you're doing is reading the slide, by the way, you're not really teaching. The slide should be as minimal as possible. Um, I know I'm covering lots of different areas and I'm kind of scattershot right now, but um, I miss the air of grievances and well, I like ice cream. So Ian and um, other gentlemen on the panel. So what Ian's talking about um, with that cognitive pause, um, how you do an instructional block, the old way used to be something called stacking, right? So let's take basketball as an example. And your coach would say, do 53 throws. Get up there on the line, do 50 free throws. And there was no observation and correction, just do 50, right? That's stacking. It's a bunch of fucking repetitions with no mentorship or evaluation or coaching. The new cognitive model for excellence is something called grouping. And grouping is, as opposed to 50 repetitions of two speed, lead, speed reload two, it's let's do five of those. Let's do five repetitions of two, speed reload two. I'm going to watch you. You're still shooting low left after your reload because you're anticipating and you're not doing shoot, reload, shoot. It's one continuous movement as opposed to three co components. You get better results when you do the grouping versus the stacking. So you have a group on the line, the first relay. They do their drills with grouping. You kick them off the line. And you have the second relay come on. 
They do the same set of drills. The first relay is doing what, as Ian was kind of talking about. They're reloading magazines. They're talking. They're processing what they've observed and they felt kinetically. Um, and they're absorbing the information. If I stacking is like a, fi a three inch fire hose opened all the way up and you're trying to get a drink of water off of it. Grouping is like a garden hose on trickle and you can get that, you can get that hydration. You can get that information with a slow trickle of information ver versus a full on blast of information. So if you don't give your students an opportunity to process the information, again, you're not a good instructor. You're just spewing stuff out there because that's the POI, that's the block of instruction that you were told to teach a group of people at a certain date and a certain time, and you're failing your students. You're not giving them the opportunity to absorb that information and process it. And then, you know, after I would do first relay, kick them off, bring up second relay, kick them off, first relay would come back up. I would do the same drill plus one other component. Before I did that, I'd say, okay, we just did this drill. Why is it important? Again, Socratic method is very important. Why is this important, right? Why are we doing this? How is this relevant to what we do as a group or a unit? Is it, you know, important because you're running this Mark 19 or are you doing this because you're running comms and EW environment? It doesn't matter what it is. But if you're not getting that feedback from your students and they say, hey, I still don't understand, okay, we'll go back to the first thing that we did, the first component of this first block. We'll go back to this first block and we'll skip the second block right now. And we'll do this first block over again. And we'll slow down just a little bit. We'll back off the throttle just a hair so that you understand why this is valid and why this is important. So you have to give these people this cognitive pause and you have to give them a reason for a cognitive pause. You have to reinforce the block before with, with uh, grouping versus stacking or you're gonna lose your audience. And as the Colonel was talking about, you know, you have to be relevant to the generational people that you're teaching. If you don't understand that, you know, teaching old dudes that ran wheel guns, you know, in the 1800s is completely different than dudes that fucking live on, you know, Xbox, right? You have to understand all that stuff. As an instructor, if you're not cognizant of those different, those uh, generational differences, you're going to lose the bubble. Um, and if you're not good enough as an instructor to teach to somebody that's 55 years old and somebody that's 19 years old, why are you there? Anyway, that's observations. Hey, one of the things I wanted to come back to real quick, and uh, I, I just texted out a few minutes ago. I'm going to have to break out of here in about 10 minutes or so. Um, but the one of the things, we, the question that was asked earlier, um, I think, by you, Matt, was how do you, if you don't have leadership, you know, uh, assess the quality of your instructors? And, you know, there are tools in all of our courses, no matter what course, should have some kind of feedback mechanism built into it at the end of the course, you know, or even in halfway through the course. Um, because that gives the instructors the ability to see themselves as well. And it, and it should be done in such a way that it, that it, it can't be seen as anything that would be punitive to the student. Um, you know, it's an a, a, uh, anonymous type assessment. We all know how anonymous stuff goes. You get, you know, half of it's not worth a damn, you know, and you're left with the other half and probably a quarter of that is, 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 is worth, uh, is really worth the paper it's written on. Um, but, that even if you get a quarter of really good feedback, you know, whether you're, it's, whether it's for the instructor or it's for the chain of command, whatever it's for, it's going to be useful, you know, because there are people out there, like, like was said earlier, that are going to be sitting in the course and if it's, they're getting just lectured to, or they're getting PowerPointed to death, or as was just said, you know, if we're, if you're, if you're, if you're not reaching them, cause you're, you're, you're not, you know, you're not, you're, you're not taking into consideration their generational, uh, needs, then, you know, they need to have a way to, to reach back and say, Hey, look, this is, you know, this is a waste of my time, you know, and in, in law enforcement courses, when a lot of times you guys are going out, you know, and paying for courses that you have to do or go and stay at a hotel or whatever to go to some training, if it ain't worth a damn, it ain't, you know, the, you just, then you're out money. Um, and so I would, I would just encourage to ensure that all our courses, no matter what course you have, has some type of feedback mechanism attached to it over. 
Hey, all you army dorks out there. Uh, it's not like this is new stuff. There is an excellent observation sheet here put up by Tradoc. Again, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, there, there's fantastic resources out there. You just got to know where to look for them. Um, and by the way, that's why Lethality Ranch was created. Go visit. Uh, let me shift gears here. Uh, there, there's a question in the queue. We've got it in chat, and it actually, this is going to circle back into it, but let me shift gears. We've been talking about relevance, showing the learner why it's important. Well, we've got a whole bunch of people watching this brief right now, and all of them, some of them probably are, but all of them are certainly not schoolhouse instructors. We've been talking primarily, I'd say 90% so far in the schoolhouse environment, talking about schoolhouse instructors. But if you look at any organization, whether it's military law enforcement, I worked in a furniture factory for a little bit before I joined the army. And it doesn't matter any organization, anywhere. If you're in a leadership role, one of your responsibilities is what it's developing your people to accomplish their mission. If, if you're not developing your people and you're a leader, it doesn't matter where you are you're failing. So we're, we're talking about following POIs, following lesson plans, and, and doing all this stuff where in a schoolhouse environment, the instructor, that, that stuff's provided for them because you've got training developers in the army that are here in their hierarchy, and then you've got your instructors doing the platform instruction here. What if you're an organizational leader say you're a squad leader in XYZ rifle company or XYZ transportation company, ABC division. Why is what we're talking about important to that individual? So I, I can answer that. This is why it's important. Because at some point, Anything that you're taught in a schoolhouse has to be taught at the unit. That's where, that, that's why it's actually there, right? And everything should be evaluated. It should be prescriptive to understand what a base level is, right? As far as performance and actual cognitive ability. And then based off of that, right? Once you get those sets and those reps, you move into the situation, right? Now you're actually applying it into a situation that's always different, it's never the same, right? To see, um, where it fits and where it doesn't fit. Um, as far as what goes on, it's like, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it again. It's like at every level of NCOES, it's taught, but it's not reinforced. And that's ELN. The experiential learning model is there. And it's the way that the, the military teaches. It, the, the problem is that our, um, you know I mean? our experiences are our censorship, right? If, if I'm good at doing something one way, that's how I'm going to do it. But wait a I'm minute. Good is it taught? Mind. Is What's it that? taught and not, is it taught and not reinforced? Yeah, or is taught. it conducted? Or is it conducted? Because if it's conducted, it the but it's, but it's not explained and imitated and practiced. Is it really taught? Hey, we're using the Socratic method in the, in the classroom, as Mike said. Okay. This is awesome. And you learn it's, through your experiences, but if, but if you're not told why it works and why you should do it, are you going to do it or are you going to go back to your unit and get a slide deck from somebody else and put it on a screen and read the slide deck because that's what you've seen elsewhere? So, so, I'll, make, so I'll make three points. One, it is taught. It is, it is absolutely a lesson plan that is taught. The problem is, again, it all depends on the instructor. And when you have competing priorities and your graduation requirement isn't to graduate with a thorough understanding of the experiential learning model as a sergeant, you know what I mean, as a leader, you're not, you're not graded on your ability to be able to teach. You're not. You're graded on your ability to pass a PT test, um, know the systems and processes that the Army operates under, including drills and ceremony. Um, and, and other things not relative to that. Again, th their, their ability, again, that it is in the lesson plans. They are taught that. The problem is, is it's not a graduation requirement, so most of the time it's like you said. It, it's taught, right, but it's not evaluated. It's not evaluated, it's not reinforced, therefore the, the people don't get it. 
So now we're talking about standards-based education, training and education, where in many cases, you, you might as well say we teach to the test versus objective-based training and education where you're talking about competencies. If it's not on the test, it doesn't get a focus because it's not on the test and it doesn't affect graduation, but it's absolutely a core competency that people need, need to have. But if it's not on the test, hmm. Well, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the one who makes the policy, right? I, I'm, I'm in a position where I'm like, um, hey, are we really doing this right? Sometimes I agree, sometimes I don't, but we don't, we don't, we don't sign that, uh, we don't sign off on that, right? I just know so, for a fact, we, you know, it, it is what it is. Well, I'm not trying to argue or split hairs with you. It's just, uh, you know, it, it's a good point of discussion whether, no, whether we should be looking at standards-based or objective-based or somewhere in the middle or even performance-based. Oh, no, I, I think all three. Right. Because because at any time, any task can be prescriptive and descriptive. Right. At some point, you're going to have to say, hey, you know what? You have to do able to do these steps, but you have to have to do these performance measures. Right. That are critical. Right. And based off of your ability percentage wise on the performance steps and the performance measures, then you're evaluated. Good. Right. But what if you're thrust in a performance situation where you don't need steps three through five in a 10 step process because it doesn't fit that situation. What if that situation means that out of three critical requirements, you only need two, you know, you only, again, and that's where I agree. Hey, standards based for evaluation prescriptive, right? Stand, you can still do standards based and you can still do um, performance based off of a situational exercise to get the other, but there has to be a combination of all three. I think if you want a true evaluation, of someone actually getting it and their ability to sustain it, it's a completely different story. Because once they get to the unit, what is the requirement for the commander to actually ensure that that training is being conducted and basically kept? There's not. That's the challenge of uh, creating evaluations that are uh, well-engineered. So a lot of instructors or trainers will do evaluations or exams or tests that are multiple yes. And they're possibly the worst way you can go about uh, evaluating uh, whether learning took place. Uh, recognition as opposed to recollection of, of information and knowledge. Uh, then of course there's the uh, demonstration of skills that uh, we're talking about. And you know, a lot of times organizations uh, fall back to making the evaluation easy on the organization as opposed to doing right by the student and evaluating the student properly. So uh, th there's this inverse relationship between ease of execution and the actual value of the evaluation. So uh, uh, trainers and schoolhouses um, owe it to the, to, to the Army or, or the Marine Corps or whatever branch or department you're at to have well-engineered and constructed evaluations. Um, and getting back to what Mike and Dave were talking about, by its very nature, the Army educational uh, system is an outcomes-based um, uh, 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 by design. It's outcome-based. Um, so, as it, in an organization as large as the Army, it becomes difficult to mass produce uh, knowledge across the board without falling back to, you know, writing something down and make it, you know proscriptive and, and, and outcome based and and uh, very by the book and you start teaching to the exam like you have common core now um, it's uh, and uh, I like bourbon so outcomes based and uh, LE is a tricky thing because some departments or agencies uh, when they're doing their firearms quals um, once you meet the standard on the qual for pistol, rifle, shotgun, doesn't matter what it is, they stop the test. And that's wrong. Let me tell you why. Because you're not capturing the data points. If you score the target through the entire qualification and you see somebody going up and down and up and down, you can give some counseling and some further instruction. If you just go to the point where they pass the qual, 
you can't evaluate that student as an instructor and give them further instruction and help. So in law enforcement, we don't often have a lot of outcome space. We do to the bare minimum to pass post quals as opposed to finding excellence. And I find that abhorrent. That just pisses me off. Well, with that so, in mind also, it seems most officers are just striving for that minimum, which is the qual. And my department's qual, we don't, we don't shoot at 25 yards. I do. I enjoy it. But no. Handguns, including rifles, we're not shooting at 25 yards. And let me, let me talk about passion for a second and like, like lack of burnout as an instructor. So I was teaching at the academy. And I had a switched on dude from Kansas. He came down to do our instructor development course. And we were talking about foot pursuits going around structures. I said, dude, don't hug the wall, go wide. And he's like, why? I said, because you have a more of a reactionary gap if you do that. And he didn't understand. I showed him some stuff around the building, you know, where we had the classroom. I said, look at this, look at the angles, look at the geometry. So keep that in mind next time you do a foot pursuit around a building like a Walmart and you roll up into a fucking, you know, a dumpster. You know, what is your reactionary gap? He's like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. About six months later, I get an email. Hey, dude, I was in a foot pursuit. I did what you told me to. The dude shot where he thought I was going to be. I was in another place and I got to take the guy down. And that's the validation as an instructor that you get. I gave him a skill or knowledge of a skill or a, a, an appreciation of a concept that he wouldn't have gotten from another instructor probably. And it saved his ass. And that made me feel so good and it validated my effort to do the little extra thing I had to do that day on lunch break is, hey, let's go to this building, I'm gonna show you why. Here's the geometry of this. You don't get burned out if you have that passion. If you just do the PowerPoint presentation and you do the fucking POI, on the fucking KD range, on the square range, and all you're doing is punching the blocks and checking the boxes, you're never gonna have that passion and get that feedback and that, that feeling of being important for other people. And if you can't do that as an instructor, go work at McDonald's. Absolutely. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you, like I've been an instructor um, in three different places and I've never had it because I've never, I, I can honestly say this, um, I've never worked a day since I was 18. I haven't. Like, I, I, I love what I do. Luckily, I'm getting paid for it. Um, I told myself and off, uh, off the advice of my dad that, you know, I mean, never work. Do what you love and, you know, and, and, and the money will come. I'm, I'm lucky to actually be able to live that. Um, I know people get burnt out based off of, uh, turbulence and friction at, at places, right? And as leaders, that's where you need to put yourself in that point of friction to be that pressure relief to, to get guys days off. Um, you know, sometimes I've been criticized because uh, guys will have to be working that day, but they'll come up and say, Hey, something, and they'll just routinely just like, Hey, yeah, something's going on at home. And I'll just be like, go home. You know, I, I don't, I don't see the point in somebody being there if they got something going on. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're not good at home, you're not good. You're not good at work. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather have you hundred percent here than, than 50, 50. Um, and, and that just goes to taking care of your people. Um, and what the Colonel said with their needs and stuff like that, but also with that is self care. You know, if you got, if you got a lot going on, um, and you got a lot of stress, you gotta, you gotta come up on the radar and you gotta let, you gotta let people know that you got some stuff going on, whether it's, uh, you know, your tribe, your, your, your bosses, your, your people like that. Um, and that's sometimes that's harder, especially in like a, a, it depends on the culture, right. Um, what you have and, um, to go back to what me and me and Mike were talking about, right. Cause words have meanings. He's absolutely right. Um, when I use, when I say taught, that's what they use for it. Right. Just because it's there doesn't mean it happens. Um, it is there, but it's not taught. It's not taught because it's not evaluated, it's not reinforced, and it's not carried on anywhere else where they actually do it. Um, so that's, that's my clarification. One, 
And the second is if you haven't had the opportunity to meet, do it. If you're in charge of somebody, go out and read One Minute Manager Meets the Monkey. And you will understand where the PowerPoint juggle comes from. Don't allow your subordinates to have a kickstand. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting in my sitting in my desk and like I got a list of things to do this long. And all of a sudden you go there and you get a green pin and you're like, that's not my responsibility, not my responsibility, not my responsibility. You know? Yet every time you go and give something some somebody something to do, they always come back saying, Well, I need this, well, I need that. At some point you gotta look at them and say, Stop asking me for permission. You're promoted based on your potential. Go execute. You know, um, that's why, like, if what I always tell my boss when I get there, it's just like, hey, you know what? Stop giving incentives for people. Give them, give them the Shackleton like uh, ad that he posted in the newspaper for his for his trip to Antarctica. You know, tell them you got nothing but work, hardship, out in the run, out in the rain, out in the snow, and see who will come. Those are the guys you want. That's the passion that's going to get you in the door. But give them, give them the real the real thing that's going to be happening. Don't say, Oh, well, Hey, uh, good pay days off dental medical, all that stuff. No, that's, you're going to get guys that are going to come there. And that's exactly what they want. Notice no, nothing that you advertise told them they're going to be working hard. So how could you expect for them to be working hard for you? That's, that's mine. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. And unfortunately the Colonel has to take off. We're saluting. Yeah, thanks, thanks for everybody. Thanks for letting me uh, participate today. It was uh, it really was a uh, it was an honor to be a part of this and just and, and be with you guys here. I think this is a great and important topic, and and I look forward to uh, participating in the future if I'm invited back. Yes, um, it's going to be mentorship. We're going to do it. Good. I like. I will. I uh, unfortunately will probably talk my talk ears off for that one because I have a passion Good. for. It. I think it's somewhere where we collectively are failing our people. Um, and I think we got a lot of work to do, uh, both, I think, cr of course, across the army, but uh, also I think in other agencies is probably have the same problems we do. And I think it'd be a great opportunity to, 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 you know, share some observations and some notes and, and hopefully make it better for our, for those, uh, sons, our sons and daughters that are out there getting after it. Well, Hey, again, uh, God bless all you guys. Thanks for what you do. Uh, for all of you out there listening, this is a great forum. Please continue to, to, chime in and to be a part of it because it's all about learning and getting better every single day. Um, I wish every one of you guys a happy new year. All right. Enjoy yourselves. Be safe. And uh, we'll see you on the next out, the next outing. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to have to switch over to my iPhone. My laptop's going to die. So I'm gonna just it happens. Real quick. Real quick. All right. Now that the adult supervision's <laughs> out, what do we got? Uh, we had a question in the queue from one of the viewers. We, we do need to cover that. Uh, Chris Palmer, this was a while ago. Sorry, Chris. Uh, do you differentiate between levels of instructors or instructors? Yeah. Adjunct RSO to lesson plan readers and presenters, lesson plan and development and policy makers. Absolutely. Dave, you are probably by far the best suited for that one. I do not put anybody anywhere close to a student on the line near anything until they do a certification. Two reasons, safety and credibility. If you're, if you're there and you're available as a student or as an instructor, you absolutely will interact with, with each other. You, you need to be walking around. Um, there's, there's, there's different ways to do it, right? So, you can in process, right, and then set up. Um, I think what we recommended. I don't know if it if it got if it got taken. Um, basically, the um, the first sergeant over at the the place where I work, um, he came up with the idea, and then we developed the plan together of the um, basically mirroring mirroring a, cert a certification for ranger instructors, um, and we found that that was the most practical way of doing it because again it made you do performance stuff it made you do prescriptive stuff and it made you do it made you actually apply um what you're going to be doing in the course right 
So you couldn't just wrote, memorize things and pass it. You actually had to do the evaluations that you're going to be required of students at a 10% um, at a 10% greater efficiency rate, right? So if, if, a, if you were requiring a student to pass at 36, then you had to shoot at least a 32 or 33. Well, it wasn't astronomical, like a, out of 40, but, but you, you had to do it at a higher level, right? And then everything that you did, you demonstrate. And you would do that under someone who was certified by the commander to, to actually sign off that, hey, you're good to go. And sometimes that got tricky because, again, you had people conducting the class while actually trying to certify people, too. Um, you know, and then it kind of became a Burger Kings versus a Wendy operation, right? Everybody knows, my boss tells us better, but it's like, you know why Wendy's, right, has a square, square burger, right? So you're not throwing away stuff? No, because they don't cut corners, right? That's, he, he says it better than I do. Um, but, but basically that's what it is. You'll, you'll have some guys that cut corners based off of the availability of other instructors to do the job. So if you're going to dedicate time anywhere, it should be that certification. Like I don't, I would not let anybody go in front of a stud, in front of anybody until they pass a certification. And you're absolutely positive that when they go up there, one, they're prepared, one, they know their shit. And then three, that they actually don't, don't embarrass you or embarrass themselves, you know? And then, and then it goes in the, uh, something that me and Mike were talking about the other day. If an, if an instructor fails in front of a student, that's okay. Like there's, there's this, there's this weird thing. Like, you know what I mean? Um, me and Mike were having this like, okay, what happens if you're shooting at 150 meter target? For some reason, you just don't adjust for that trajectory just quite enough, right? You miss it, but then you correct yourself and you come back and you fix it. Right. To me, that, that's not a, that's not a mistake. That doesn't make you look bad as an instructor, right? That makes you, that makes you actually practice what you preach. Right. If, if you're one of those instructors that go out there and you just have to do everything perfect at a faster rate of speed for everybody, then you're missing the point. You know, uh, case in point, like I had, I had an instructor who was fast, man. This guy was master rated. I was like, oh, I don't even know what, the, I didn't even know what that meant at the time. He was like master rated. And that guy can get in front of, in front of an entire class and he can just burn it down in an A zone. No problem. Right. And the only thing anybody got out of that block of instruction when you looked at the survey was him shoot fast. And when you actually went and you saw them actually perform, all they were trying to do was just be as fast. It wasn't, hey, are the mechanics right? Do these drills make sense? Am I actually doing this correctly within my capability? Am I actually doing this at a proficiency level that would actually maximize my ability to understand? and process what I'm seeing through my sights and through them. It, it, you, you have to be able to do that and all that's for a certification. You gotta be able to grab a certif that certification is gonna let you temper test, right? Prejudge and do everything you have to do because at the end of the day, you have to, you have to. Again, if you're in charge, again, these guys are within your scope of responsibility and authority, these guys are doing that job. It's the same thing with police departments, right? If, if if this guy, this instructor, right, or this girl is teaching this person, they're going to have to, right? Somebody's, somebody's going to have to sign off on it, right? Or somebody's going to have to take responsibility at the end of the day. Um, I, maybe you guys can both answer this, Mike and, Mike and uh, Matt. If you go somewhere to get a block of instruction by an instructor, right, and then suddenly that technique you learned in that place if you were involved in the shooting with that, could that come up in a legal proceeding? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so that certification, right? So you, you, you definitely have to do your homework. Well, it's the same thing. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it's your side or our side. You know, uh, you, you have to go to a credible source who you could actually reach back to and actually be like, hey, I, they're doing this right. Okay. Uh, me and Mike actually had this conversation. Um, my cues are about the one reload one drill and how it's like, it's great, but if you're wasting 30 rounds on it, you're probably not, probably not doing something correctly. Um, but, but can you explain a little bit more about that stuff with you guys? Like, Hey, like your, your guys' ability to go out and pay for that instruction. But then if you get in a situation, obviously that's going to get recalled. Well, 
first of all, so Dave and I had a, a phone conversation the other night, right, Dave? And um, one of the things we talked about, and I won't name the agency, but um, certain agencies are hesitant to put their instructors up there and shoot because if they make a mistake, they don't want to see the students see them fail, which is fucking stupid. So if I make a mistake and I use, we were talking about this, if I was doing an NSR drill, explaining why it's important and how you do it, and I was going to demonstrate it, and I kind of fucked it up a little bit, that was a teaching moment for the students. I could say, this is why I fucked this up. I overran my trigger reset. This is why you don't overrun your trigger reset. So let's do the drill again. I'll demonstrate it again. Hopefully I won't jack this up and look like an idiot. But that's why that happened. So here's a teaching point or a learning point for you as students. To the other point that Dave's talking about, if an instructor teaches a block of instruction based on post in a certain state and a deputy or an officer goes out there and uses it incorrectly, there's a likelihood that the instructor at the academy or the person um, that did their evaluation at the department or the agency will be called into court to explain why that technique was used. If the instructor didn't teach it properly and didn't ensure the student understood it and it was used improperly, that's a liability for not only the instructor, but for the department and the agency. So it's incumbent upon us as instructors not to fucking do that. Um, you don't want to get called into court and get subpoenaed and say, well, my, my, uh, my FTO said this is how we do this. Or at the academy, I was taught to do this. And that's contrary to what post or um, what um, best practices are um, explaining or outlining. If you go beyond that or you don't understand that as a student and the instructor doesn't catch that, that's on the instructor or the academy or the FTO. And that's a huge no-no. Does that make sense, Dave? No, that, that makes absolute sense, right? So it's, it's the same thing. It's the same thing with us, right? Ex except it's, for us, it's an external evaluation, right? So we have lesson plans, right? They're in a book. Um, and they're based off of modules and at any time an evaluator can come down and basically audit um, the course, right? And if you're, if you're teaching something that's not in there, right? And I'm not talking about, obviously there's, there's deviation that's going to happen in every block of instruction based off the audience, right? And based off the instructor. Um, but if it's just like, hey, you're completely missing the mark, you're not actually doing anything that you're supposed to be doing here. Um, it could, it could screech halt things pretty quick. Um, and, and, and people are going to get uh, mentored for it, uh, for sure. Um, I know, I know that, that, that that's kind of for you guys. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know how you guys fix that. Um, I don't think there's an actual like outside entity that does an external evaluation on your guys' courses. Um, okay, so so if there's if there's a if there's an anomaly in a department um, that has been trained by an academy shows some inconsistencies over a period of time, another agency within the state usually takes over the investigation. But that would have you'd have to see a lot of instances where there's a problem, and it's it's very rare that that would ever happen. Um, and regarding um, blocks of instruction. Um, I did a thing at the academy. I went to Rob Hot's shotgun instruction, right? Who is the master blaster. And um, he, he taught me quite a bit of important stuff. He, he imparted upon me a huge cornucopia and a diverse array of knowledge when it comes to running a shotgun. And I get back to the academy and I talk to the head farms instructor, Bill. I'm like, hey, dude, we need to change this uh, fucking POI, these blocks of instructions. He's like, why? Said, because there's some new hotness out there and we're not doing it. He's like, okay, well, I'll give you part of the class. We'll modify some shotguns for length of pull and some other things. And I'll let you run a part of the class in a separate bay during the academy. 
that was off the script, completely off the script from what post and what the academy required. My students, who are all the small, short, diminutive, elfin, pixie-like motherfuckers, outshot all the corn-fed, I shot my daddy's fucking goose gun motherfuckers, 100%, because I gave them some skill sets and some knowledge, and I, I explained it in such a way that they could understand why the tool they were using would be better served if they used it a different way. So it's okay to go off the script as long as you, A, explain it, but most importantly, you document it. If you deviate from a POI or a block of instruction for whatever reason in law enforcement, you have to document the fuck out of that. If you fail to do that, you're wrong. It's a liability. And Dave and I were talking about this the other night. I have done some blocks of instruction for some people, some places. They were so far ahead of the power curve, I threw half the POI right out the fucking window. And we just advanced past day two and went to day three immediately went beyond that, but I had to document that in my, not, in my, uh, my notes to hand it off to the CO or the XO or whatever. You can do that, but you have to know your audience and their skill sets and you have to evaluate them, you know, on the initial presentation on the range when you're watching him um, shoot whatever block of instruction, you your, baseline to, your baseline you test your baseline test. That's too, right? The instructor has got to be able to have that skill set. Right. Exactly. So I, I'm rambling here because Dave knows I'm hyper tangential, but, um, so, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. So, there, like, if it's one thing I know, it's that, it's that any organization, no matter how big or small, it's always changes, changes always like turning an aircraft carrier, right? It, 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 it's not there for – you don't change for, for just, you know, any little thing. Um, it's been my experience. So, I've, I've, I used to hate it, right, when I was a guy – when I was a guy – when I was a guy in the operational level or the, the tactical level, I hated it. Right. And when I'm a guy at the organizational level, I'm, I, I enjoy it. Right. So how does, how does that affect us? So if I have a lesson plan and I want to change it, if you, if you don't know the process and sim, uh, system to change it, Oh, you're going to have a terrible day. It's going to, it's going to be horrible. It's going to, it's going to be like pulling teeth without like Novocaine. But if you actually know how to do it, it's as simple as print out a copy of the way it is, print out a copy of it, of the way you want it, present it to somebody in charge who can sign off on it before the class, rehearse it, and conduct it. That's it. That's all you need to do. But you would be surprised how many people when you're just like, hey, you want to change something? Like, yeah, what do you want to change? Okay. Um, do this, do this. Oh gosh. Oh, wailing and gnashing of teeth everywhere. You know, when it's as simple as two print jobs, a red pen and going before somebody with approval authority and saying, this is what we, this is what we're doing now. This is what we want to do. Here's the reason why and the data behind it. Let's do it. See the difference between what you're talking about in the mill and the LE side is that we don't have those standards across the board across the country right we don't we, we absolutely don't have that so i was doing a thing in michigan for some people it was a 3 a pistol class and we were supposed to be outside it was a, a fucking goddamn hurricane the entire time we got to go to an inside facility and i had to on the fly change the poi based on the structure we could shoot in and the um, limitations of that structure they still got their instructional block. They still learned the lessons that I was trying to teach them, but I didn't have to worry about going to, you know, a captain at the agency or the department to get approval for that. I had to do, I had to have the ability to do it on the spot. I know that's a, a, a um, an advantage in some ways, and it could be a pain in the ass in some ways. You know, you guys have a completely different um, set of parameters that you have to work with then. So I'm, 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 I'm with you and I understand it, that that is probably an advantage and it is probably a disadvantage. I would say it's a disadvantage because you really can't go anywhere without having to start over. Um, is that correct, Matt? Would that, would that be right? Like you guys really can't, like if you 
go from one station to another, you pretty much started over? Completely depends on the agency. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so for, that, for that block of instruction I'm talking about in Michigan, I didn't have to start over. I just had to truncate certain components of the POI and amplify others because our distance was limited. So I couldn't shoot at certain distances, but I could do more sets and repetitions um, at closer ranges. Gotcha. Okay. So you, so you basically were like, Hey, you know what? I can do this through, through basically rep, repetition based off of performance, things like that. Yeah. So, I mean, I couldn't shoot 25. I could shoot 15 and in. So I focused on what I could do within that structure inside because outside it was, you know, raining cats and dogs, you know, ghostbusters kind of shit. I could, there, we couldn't keep, we could not keep paper targetry up to save our ass. Couldn't tape anything. Everything melted in the rain. We had an inside structure. I got to use the inside structure. They had certain rules and requirements on the distance and some other shit. And I'm like, okay, I have to throw this component of the POI out the window. But the rest of the POI, I can rock on with. And because we have an ammo allotment for this class of, you know, 1,500 rounds of pistol, I'm going to make sure that we get good repetitions in with that 1,500 rounds. I'm not going to waste a goddamn round. You know, I'm going to make sure that it's used efficiently so that you get best absorption of the skill sets we're trying to impart upon the student. But I had some limitations based on environment and available um, resources. So I had to completely rework the POI. Everything got done that was supposed to be done. You know, malfunction clearance drills, um, everything that we had to do, working on uh, draw stroke and presentation reloads, the whole, the whole package. But I couldn't do anything out to distance. So I had to rewrite the POI. And when I got done with the class, I made notations in my POI for that class so that if liability ever came up, well, they taught us this. Well, no, I taught you this based on the environmental considerations, not based on what you wanted, but, but this is what we had. You know? And it, as an instructor or as an organization, if you don't understand how to shift gears to accommodate those situations, why are you doing the goddamn job? You don't understand what you're doing. No, so I, I, I agree with you completely on that, right? There, there's, I, have, I have heartburn with that type of attitude, though, if it's the primary go-to. If you're, if you're showing up and you're making it happen, that could work, right? But are you actually putting yourself in a position where you can actually develop and build the block of instruction and present it, right? Because once, once you start getting in the realm of, showing up to to and i'm not saying you're doing this right i'm saying like there's there's a poi right and that program of instruction is set with the resources and sequencing of how you're going to do things right then there's a lesson plan that has tasks and subtasks that you're actually going to teach right it's it's the building block of hey the main idea objective of this is to learn this right we're going to teach it like this and we're going to evaluate it like that Right. And that's going to build into, like you said, the grouping of these three things. These three things are going to get chunked together. It's going to be evaluated in combination, things like that. I, I have a huge problem with instructors who don't do their prep work. Right. Like if you're going to be teaching something, you got to do the prep. If you do the prep, you'll be nimble enough and you'll be flexible enough. So when you get there, right, you'll be fine. But if you show up and you're one of those guys that's sitting there saying, I don't have the slides, I can't teach this, then you really didn't know anything to begin with. You know what I mean? If Guess what? If I showed up and you had five rounds, I could do it with five rounds. We're just going to be doing a lot of dry fire, man. Yep, exactly. So if you don't, it's priming the pump. So cognitively, if I prime the pump and I do a lot of things that don't require rounds down range, if I just spend time on, if I'm on the line with students and I'm just having them, they're, they're downloaded completely. I'm just watching draw strokes and I can unfuck a couple people on the line on the draw strokes. Before we start loading up, making ready and putting rounds down range, I've 
compress the learning cycle, flatten the learning curve out considerably by, by focusing on that shit on the front end as opposed to working through the problem um, when we're putting down, rounds down range. Um, and, and that's being qualified and uh, aware enough with the students you have in place because sometimes you get a class of studs. And sometimes I had a class in Texas. It was a night fire pistol class. And I had some return students that were hammers. And I had some people that shouldn't have been in the class. And I had to restructure the um, relays in order to make sure that I had certain people on lateral left and lateral right. So they're only dangerous in one direction. And um, call upon some uh, previous students to help me do safety because I was a lone instructor for whatever reason. Um, but you have to be, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, that's, that's why me, me, uh, Mike Lewis and Ian, like we're, if it's one thing I know that we're all about, it's the baseline, man. You got yeah. it. When, whenever you get a group in a class, you got a baseline cause you got to rack and stack people right? Based off an evaluation and based off an actual like performance, right? And you got to put the weakest one with the strongest one because that's going to cut down on that, on, on that disparity, right? Right. So, so, you know, in certain classes, I've, I've, you know, people I know their quality. I know these guys are fucking hammers and I'm friends with them or I've known them for classes. I'm like, Hey, look, bro, I'll have a private conversation. Look, I'm going to put you next to this guy. Who's a soup sandwich, basically. You know, I can't watch 10 people on the line by myself. I'm, that's my situation. I don't have any choice on the matter. It's, it's where I was. And they're like, yeah, no problem. I'm like, just make sure, you know, keep an eye on them. You can shoot like a fucking house on fire. I don't have to fucking worry about you. I will give you some fine tuning. I will watch you and say, hey, bro, this is why you're having this inconsistency because you're not locking your shoulders out or your draw stroke is, is inconsistent. Let's focus on that. Your next, you know, 10 repetitions, but do me a favor, your left eye, keep your eye on that dude on your left. You know, you can, you can, as an instructor, you can um, recruit other people within the class to help you achieve your goals. A lot of instructors are afraid to do that for whatever reason. I have no idea why, but um, that can be done. I, so, so I've had guest instructors, right? Um, but I, I was, I only had them fill in as far as the, um, as the, uh, the lecture portions, right? Or like the, uh, the explain and demonstrate portions. Um, unless again, we could go through the, you know, the process of, Hey, if you're going to be in charge of running this drill to teach it, let's, let's talk about what we're trying to get after. Because obviously, you know, if, when you have a boss, you have a boss, right? And you don't, you don't want your boss to show up and you're just like doing whatever. Cause that's, you know, that's, that's a break of trust. Um, I think if you're going to have a guest instructor, again, it's on you to provide them that syllabus. Right. And cause, cause everybody has different ways of doing things. Right. Um, there's always, it's always great to be open-minded and know, know about new things but you shouldn't test things like that live in front of a group of students without knowing about it um, would, would be my, my uh, I guess, I guess that would be my, my, uh, my experiential um, censorship. Like I would, I would freak out about that. I'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like if we, if we want to try something new, let's, let's test it out after class and let's check it out, but let's not, let's not do it live in class without actually rehearsing it first. Cause that could, that could be um, that could be unsafe, right? And that could be um, that could be problematic, especially if you're if it, if you're going to give a certification or an uh, uh, an additional skill identifier afterwards. Well, that could be that could be bad, problematic. Well, I've, I've been a student in certain instructor classes, and I step out of certain drills because they're fucking unsafe. You know, I, I I'm not doing that fucking goddamn drill. Because you're a, you're fucked up, I will not do that drill. Be, oh, it looks cool on the internet, it's cool on the gram, it's cool on YouTube, 
But you know what? Go fuck yourself because I don't know the quality of every other shooter in this class. I'm going to go take a shit or I'm going to go have a lick you and chewy or I'm going to do whatever. I'm going to load mags. Rock on with what you're doing, but that's not my job. You know, you want to put these people in a position of peril. That's on you as an instructor and I'm not going to have anything to do with that crap. You know, so what you're saying, Dave, is I completely concur and agree as instructors. Look, I taught a certain way. Matt knows I'm very Zen and like, hey, bro, look, this is why this is happening. Well, let's talk about this. Why do you think this is going on? Why are your shots in this position on the target consistently? Oh, I don't know. We talked about it in class, in the lecture. What did I tell you? Um, I don't remember. Well, let's discuss it again. That's my, that's how I do shit. Other instructors are more knife hand in your face, screaming in your face. And some people are receptive to that. Other people are more receptive to what I do. But I never got into conflict with any other instructor that I ever worked with. You know, Louis Arbuck, Pat Rogers, you know, any of these guys I ever worked with. We never conflicted in front of the students. We would take that stuff off to the side and discuss it because we had to be on the same page about 95% so that there was no conflict and the students didn't pick up on that fucking vibe and so that we taught them what they needed to learn. Does that make sense? No, that, that, that makes absolute sense. Um, you know, I think I only had, in my, in my 18 years now, I've only had, had one conflict that actually ended up in front of students and that was actually um not one of my best moments i would say but it was absolutely like if everyone around knew the context they would have been like yeah man that need to happen you know um if you're if, you, if you're in charge you're in charge you know what i mean it's not it's not a thing about um you know if, if you have to tell somebody you're in charge you're in charge right but overall responsible um, if you're in a position you're saying, Hey, this is, Hey guys, let's have a meaningful conversation. Let's talk about it. Okay. This is what I'm thinking about doing. This is what it says we have to do. This is what we're going to do. Are there any disagreements? And then there's no disagreement. Right. But then you go in front of a, a, a group of students and magically somebody's doing their own thing. Right. So you see that one class and you're like, Hey, okay, check this out. We're going to come out. Hey, you can't do that. You know, we already talked about this. We already decided as a group, this is what we're going to do. Um, you know what I mean? Let's not do that. Next class, right? Does the same thing. At that point, I was like, no, nah, man. Hey, in front of the students, I was like, come here. This is how we do it. This is the way it's done. Do you agree, Sergeant? And that was, and that was the end of that. I was, I was told I was unprofessional, you know? Um, and, and what I got out of that was, I took the guy aside again and I was just like, like sitting there going like, Hey, like, you know what? It wasn't as unprofessional as what you did because what you did was you went, you went against the team. You did your, you did your own thing and you put all of us in a predicament where if we evaluated that guy on the way we all decided we were going to evaluate him on, they could have been like, that's the way I was taught. And it's uh, again, it's, it's one of those things. That's, that's the only situation I've ever been in with it. Um, but, but again, it all, it all works out. Things like that. But it all goes back to developing those blocks of instructions, being able to like present them, you know what I mean? And then evaluating them within your own formation so that you can know what that end product's gonna look like. So that if you show up, you can actually be flexible enough to adapt to a situation if it changes. It's not your it's not your go-to move. Being adaptable should be your should be your second or third, right? Because you did the prep work. Um it's it's a function of being prepared. It's not the result of not preparing. Yeah, so so I've had students come up to me. And I'm like, look, here's our, here's our zero. That's how we teach a zero, right? We do whatever. And sometimes you can. This is this is law enforcement, and Matt knows what I'm talking about. Sometimes you get an agency or department that says, well, this is our zero. And you'll try to explain why that might not be the best idea. Um, but I don't want to fuck with SOP and departmental policy. I will say, okay, that's fine. 
you do your zero and you shoot the drills based on your zero. We'll see what the outcomes actually flesh out as. There's a department around here that argued for a very long time for a seven meter zero. I shit you not. Uh, yeah. And I said, why? I was waiting for the punch line. I'm not going to lie. I was. So you and right. I talked about, you and I talked about this. Yeah. All and right. I'm like, and I'm like, why? Well, because everything we're going to do is inside a structure. I'm like, what if you're doing perimeter containment? What's, what's, what's the fucking, what's the average shot down a Walmart fucking, you know, lane? What's the average shot in a fucking school bus? What's, what's that distance? So if you don't understand the ballistics, and Mike, you know, was talking about this earlier, if you don't understand why the ballistics are important, that's your, your brain is your ballistic computer. If you don't understand why that works, you know, you have a problem. So it baffles me um, that people as instruct instructors don't have the ability to impart or correct misinformation. Does that make sense? No, no, absolutely. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of guys that I know that promote misinformation. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I'm going to, I'll say this one thing, okay? If you're using a device that you put in front of a red dot optic and you think that's the thing that's going to help you out because parallax is there, then I I can't help you. If if you if you induce parallax in that thing, there's only one way you can do it. Your head has to be craned all the way like that at 25, and your your first problem is not the parallax in that thing. It's definitely the stock weld, and it's definitely your position behind that gun. You know, but there's there's still people out there that swear by it. You know, um, so there's there's plenty of misinformation out there, and, and the best way I found to to do that is just one, either just just say Roger, and then continue moving, you know, or or actually do a practical exercise where you're just like, yeah, this thing is, is like um, not even in your realm of worry when you're actually doing this, right? Or it's like, hey, you definitely shouldn't be doing this. On the zero part, um, this is what I'll say because there's there's a problem with the zero in the army too. Right. There's an you know, institution, but right? So there's an institution that finds that a 200 meter zero is what they want to do. Okay. Um, they absolutely have the ability to do it. Okay. They do it because more targets pop up at the 250, 150 and two, or 200 range, right. Than 300 does with the 200 meter zero, you actually get point of aim, point of impact all the way out to 250. So you can hit more targets without shifting your, your, your sights, you know, from center, center mass. Um, does that work? Yeah, for the test. Um, but what I think what we what we're missing is that okay, the well, the purpose of zeroing is to maximize your ability on the weapon after you know where the bullet's going. So if if you don't know where the bullet's going, then your problem isn't zeroing, right? It's 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 that you don't you don't you don't know what you're doing. If you get point of aim, point of impact at 25 meters, and you don't know what that's going to do at 300, 400, 500, then then you don't know what you're doing. You you did it to hit the target at 25. The punchline to that seven yard zero or whatever, large, well known agency with a very well known SWAT team, and we got in a, in there's a member of that organization that uh, left our fine network because we brought this to their attention and they did not like hearing that. So he took his toys and went home. I, I see. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't give a shit. You yeah. know? I, I wouldn't give a shit either. I mean, if somebody told me just like, yeah, we zero at seven meters, I'd be like, Oh, what's, what's the down range on that? Like what's the, I'm what's, what's, what's I'm, the disparity there? I'm confused. <laughs> We're talking seven meters with a rifle. Yes, seven correct? meters with a fucking HK. Yes. Okay, just a four, six, a four sixteen because only do entries and HRT kind of shit. I'm like, no, dude, 
You know, what if you're doing containment? What if it's a school situation? What if it's in a Walmart? What if it's a local choke and puke? What if it's at the fucking you know, truck stop? I'm like, you guys are fucked up. No, wrong. Point is, okay. I doesn't have a pistol grip just, on. You'd be all right. Just because I'm a nerd, I ran the numbers on that. And if an E type is your target with a seven meter zero, you have to hold almost a half target frame low at a hundred. Here's yeah, your got, three quarters. This is yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, that's that's a lot of drop right there. No, that's a hold under. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm like, yes. what, I'm, I'm like, well, oh. I, asked, I asked the idiots. I'm like. What's the distance of the average block in your city? Like, huh? <laughs> do what? <laughs> and I'm like, do you understand how ballistics actually fucking work? So your, your instructor who does your farms instructor blocks is teaching you this shit because you think you know more than people smarter than you, your, your, your betters, so to speak. Um, this is the proof is in the pudding in the science and you're rocking on with some fucking thing that somebody got in some fucking class at one time based on some horse shit. Let's go to the range and fucking shoot this shit and you'll see your error. No, man, this works. I'm like, okay, fine, man. You know, I can't help your fucking agency. Goodbye. You know, and Matt knows what I'm talking about. But also, at the same time, that is one of those things that instructors need to fight on occasion. Not too often, but on occasion as, a, as an instructor in, with a police department, sometimes a good idea fairy comes out and says, well, what about this? This sounds like the greatest thing ever. And that's where that, that baseline knowledge and, and fundamental uh, knowledge helps out. Because then we can explain, well, this is why this is not a good idea for us. Well, so if if I'd had the time and I gave a shit, I don't care because agency's stupid. But I said, let's go to the square range, the KD range, switch some paper targets up and have you shoot your drills. I'll run you through some stuff. Let's see your performance at 25 meters with that seven meter zero. Let's see how that works out. Let's go to your local Walmart and look down the aisle and see end to end the distance. Let's shoot that distance with that seven meter zero. But the fucking person in charge of instruction for that department didn't care. He had his little fiefdom, his little realm, and he was in charge of the range and all the instructional blocks, and he didn't want to hear it. So I said, yeah, I can't, I can't help you. I'm going to pass on this. I have some other shit that I can do that's going to help more people do the right thing. So goodbye, you know. Yeah, you, you got those everywhere. Uh, I, the, the range guy that uh, likes the manicured lawn and won't move the targets because you'll hit the wood or something like that. But uh, seven meters, that's that's cool. Yep. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't cool, trust me. I, hey, I'll, I'll try anything, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if I would have been cool with that. I hope. So what happened with that? Did you guys say something? Or no? Oh yeah, I'll leave that alone. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it was addressed, and he, the individual was not a fan of the feedback, and it was very similar to what we've discussed because we understand the trajectory of bullets and what happens, and and we might respond as police officers. We might respond to a parking lot or a high school or someplace that might have a hallway beyond a room. Yeah. Is there any is there any organization out there that can actually get all you guys on a national basis and figure out an instruction type deal? No, I think there are too many no. egos. Yeah. No. So you'll see. You'll yeah. see. I'm not. I'm not going to name the organization that knows what I'm talking about. But there's no. I'll, I'll name it. I won't. Um, there's no organization that uh, uh, puts themselves out there as the standard for um law enforcement when it comes to things beyond 25 meter square inch shit and what happens is somebody at the upper level at higher will go to one of these junkets 
and they will go to a conference and they will hear some people get up on uh, a lectern and discuss the pros and cons of A versus B. And the uneducated idiot that's at hire will go back to the department or the agency and say, hey, I went to this conference in Las Vegas or Orlando or wherever the fuck it was. And these are best practices. They've never put the proof into the pudding. They never jumped on the range, none of themselves. But they're the, they're the fucking asshole who's got the, you know, 15 stars on their uniform on their collar who make the command decisions for appropriations and training blocks. And they'll say, this is what we're going to do from now on. This is exactly how we're going to do these processes. This is the instructional blocks we're going to teach because I went to this conference and because I'm a moron, I'm just going to parrot what these people said without doing any due diligence and getting on the range and testing the product. So you end up with a bunch of people. We got the same problem, man. We, oh, I'm sure you do. We, we got the same problem at a whole different level. Like you got, um, we'll just say there's guys on an island, right, who, who yeah. want to specialize in shooting precision. England? No. <laughs> no, I know what he's talking about. Hawaii? They, they got guys on an island out there. Australia. A whole, a whole division of them, right? No American on an island out there that want to learn precision shooting and they want to be able to be good at precision shooting. They have the other entity who's like world renowned known for precision, right? With with the whole S thing. And they don't even talk. They'll spend thousands of dollars to send people here when they have like that right there. And they use the same facilities and the whole, the whole difference is the metric system. That's it. That's the difference. <laughs> and this isn't even getting into product endorsements. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's the other thing. Um, when you, when you start talking about, um, you know, the widgets, um, you know, I, I stand behind, um, I stand behind Paul Howe, right? If you want to, if you want to, if, if your whole thing is learning how to shoot, start with nothing on the gun, right? If you, if you want to be good at shooting, start with nothing on the gun, go use the enablers after that, right? You should maximize your live ammunition. Absolutely. With the equipment you're going to be using to, to fight, but that doesn't mean you need to practice with it all the time. You got to get good at the individual basic stuff, right? The same thing, whether it's a radio, whether it's a tourniquet, whether it's anything, right? You, you got to be able to be good at those base level things. It's, it's not all that technology isn't a substitute for anything. Now, don't get me wrong. I like I, I like technology. I like having yeah. it. Right. But sometimes you got to be that guy to, you know, or that gal. And you got to say, hey, you know what? Let's make sure I'm doing something right. I'm going to go dry fire iron sights with a bore light or an EST. You know, hey, guess what? We're not really good at understanding this whole trajectory thing. I'm taking away your enablers. We're going to the um, engagement skills trainer, right? And we're shooting out to 600, right? Because everybody's given rounds to conduct long range shooting. The whole problem is that there's not a requirement to do it. You can absolutely do it, but you're not required to do it. You're only required to shoot to 300 meters. So that's what you're going to do. Would it be beneficial for you to actually maximize out, out of that far? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. If you can, also trained to detect and identify that far but it's it's the same thing it's if if it's not a requirement it won't get it won't get done no matter where you are if i'm not paid to do it i won't do it unless i'm passionate well okay so one of the things i focus on is um airy denial um situations in asymmetrical warfare and we have all these pluggers and GPSs and all this cool fucking shit. And I gave that lecture at that one place. Technology leverages the battle space. If you own the technology and it works, great. But what happens when the technology shut off? We have failed in a lot of instances, um, and, and, and David's talking about this, 
um, to go back to the basics. Some of your shit's not going to work in Triple Canopy Jungle. Some of your shit's not going to work in, uh, let's say, Donbass, Ukraine, if you happen to be there. So if you don't um, capture or reinforce the basics on the very basic platforms that you have, um, your agency or your unit or whatever is not doing you justice. As an instructor, if you don't force that or re reintroduce that to the people you're teaching, you're wrong. You know, one of my big things is, you know, I do, I, I do some stuff with ROTC here and I'm like, uh, yeah, you got your GPS is once last time you ran a, a protractor, a compass and a fucking, um, you know, a map. Huh? Do what? The fuck is that? I'm like, okay, we're going to do an orienteering class at the state park. Meet me on Thursday night. We're going to do low light fucking, you know, land nav shit with a map and a compass because, you know, in certain places your fucking GPS isn't going to fucking work. If you don't reinforce, you know, and that's what, what Dave was talking about with Paul Howell said, start from the basics and work your way up. If the, if the cool shit fails on you, you still have to use the basics. As instructors, or, or maybe not instructors, but organizations sometimes throw the, the bare bones stuff out the window because we have all this cool guy gear. We have one to six red dot fucking LPVO. We have the fucking mall. We have great fucking armor. You know, I don't want to be wearing armor in fucking Colombia or Peru. You know, I want to be light and right. I want to be ready to go in a hurry. My, my shit's going to fog up if I'm running certain optics. The lasers are going to be worth a shit. Can you run your iron sights? Hey, do you have that fucking shotgun with flechettes? You know, we don't, we don't fucking do this stuff anymore in a lot of levels and a lot of um, institutions or agencies or um, units because it's not sexy. And sexy doesn't always win the game. Um, I mean, I, mean, you know, I agree. With, so so I, I, I – oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, with, Mike, uh, with that, Mike, I, I agree 100%. But at the same time, some asshole is going to misunderstand what you just said. They're going to think, Absolutely. oh, I have, I have to shoot iron sights all the time because Mike user said, my shit's not going to work. No, dude, you, you've got a CCO. Your CCO is going to work a huge, I, I can't even think of the ratio, but point, it, point it is going to be. 0.004%. Right. Zero zero percent failure rate in combat. It, it, it will be an extraordinary event when your CCO fails. Does that mean you shouldn't run your iron sights? Hell no. More than once I've, I've shown up to talk to an organization like, all right, cool. When's the last time you zeroed your irons? Oh, we don't do that, Sarge. We got CCOs. Oh, okay, cool. Your CCO, although the failure rate is extraordinarily low, there is a failure rate, which means you do need to work that back up. Does it mean you need to work that back up 60% of the time, 80% of the time, because that's your, your analog. No, it, it doesn't. But you do need to work that backup being the iron sight. Your priority for training should be your primary optic. But at the same time, what happens if my radio goes dead? Hey, dude, I guess you're throwing fucking smoke signals. But, you know, that's not the case. We're, we're going to train for we're going to train for a pace plan or at the very least a primary and an alternate, but the alternate should not become the primary in training because you forget how to use the primary. You want to see so, people so you can a brick, ask them to do exercises without cell phones. Say what? Say what? Asking like, organizations to run an exercise without cell phones. I mean, exactly. You, you, it's crazy. Oh, the ship falls apart. It does. Well, so let's let's take let's take a firearms instructional block. Let's do most it. Instances, most instances, your your primary is what in the military? Your carbine, right? Your M4, correct? Yes. 
but but some units have a secondary a sidearm, correct? So well, we we primarily the above has have secondaries now. That's what we're going to. Okay. Well, hopefully we get more people with secondaries, but um, so the majority of your instructional block should be primary. So so I'm I'm with you. I think everyone should have a secondary. If all yeah. you have is your rifle, I mean. You don't need to be issued issued a pistol. You should have a knife. You're, right, exactly. And you and I talked issues. about that. You're given a bayonet. You not, you, yeah, you and, I talked, you and I talked about that, right? So, but my point is, so when you're doing an instructional block, oh, let's say 70% should be on your primary, 30% should be on your secondary. If you can run your fucking secondary, Right. If you can't run your secondary, I'm gonna shift my POI, I'm gonna shift away from primary because you're pretty good at that. I'm gonna focus more on your sec, your, I'm gonna move away from your primary, excuse me, to your secondary. You guys shoot your primary fucking pretty well, but your secondary marksmanship sucks. So I'm gonna shift the POI so we can focus on this lack of um, excellence on your secondary. A lot of, a lot of people, sorry about that, a lot of people as instructors or instructors for agencies or units or departments only look at what they're given to teach and don't look at what's needed within that group that they're, that they're teaching. And a lot of times you have conflicts within the cadre we've talked about that, well, let's just stick with the primary weapon. No, these guys shoot primary fine. Their secondary sucks, which goes back to what Mike Luce was talking about. Yeah, you don't need to teach your, your analog all the time, but you still need to reinforce it occasionally to make sure that they can still do it because what happens if the primary optic system goes tits up, if you don't know how to revert back to secondary optic analog system, why are you fucking, why are you out there, you know? So, so I, because again, we're, we're talking, the, the, the context of all this is scale, right? Um, I know that I would always do a baseline with the analog, with the iron sight, and have a grouping standard for that. Um, and that was just basically to judge like how effective you are at understanding the whole side alignment, sight picture, and trigger control thing. Um, but I would absolutely be like, hey, you know what? In the amount of time I have, I have to train you on you know the equipment you have, and that's and that's and that's the red dot or or the RCO, you know, or or the um, you know the magnified the four power magnified optic so it was it's kind of like again your competing priorities i'll make sure that you you use the analog and i can make sure that you employ it at a base level right but i'm more interested in making sure that you run what you're going to have for combat that has that low that uh that low uh failure rate you know for that's at scale you know for you adjusting the poi that's that that's awesome right you you'll get more out of that but in it's uns it would be unsustainable for like seven hundred and fifty thousand people because it, every class would be different. Right, and so if if you're doing MCO versus RCO, Army versus Marine Corps, other groups versus other groups, they all have different equipment packages, and you have to work around that. You know, I I, I, I want I'm going to say this. I'm gonna, I'm not, I don't mean to cut you off, Mike. I'm going to no, say go this. Ahead. No, yeah. go ahead. In terms of scale, it's not comparable, man. The the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps is great at testing things, but as a, as a scaled size of force, they ain't shit compared to the Army. No, I understand that. I'm, my, they're, my, just not, they're just we're behemoth, man. Oh, I know, big green. I got it. You yeah. Know? Um, but my point is, is that when you're looking at cognitive development, um. You want to focus on core competencies. And so if your basic optic package is a, let's say, an aim point, or it's a um, EOTech, you know, if you're a dev core, it doesn't matter. You know, you want to spend the majority of your time honing that skill set for that specific optic. So that's 70 to 85% depending on how good the shooters are 
past that point, you still need to sometimes tap into the old school systems because, again, stuff may go tits up. You know, I agree. 100%. If, if, if you're not doing occluded, if you're not doing occluded optic drills with your red dot sights as an instructor, you're fucked up, right? Because blood, fucking mud, you know, whatever, crack lenses, that happens. So if you're not doing those occluded optic drills on that fucking RDS as an instructor, it doesn't have to be the entire class, but you have to, you have to teach people and let them understand you can run this optic when it's fucked up. You have to trust it, right? Or it doesn't work at all, but the screen is still competent or intact enough that you can run your front sight post off of that with one third offset. If you're not teaching that, what the fuck good are you? You know, those are. No, those I, are I agree. Yeah. Like, so, so I know it, I actually got this from, from Ash. He, he actually told me about it. We were doing when, when he was telling me about how um, the new qualification was made up in the, in the practice. What you should be doing is a, in, during the practice qualification right at the table five is you should be inducing malfunctions and you should be like, Hey, you know what? Guess what? Your primary went out, you know, go to, go to your backup iron sites. You know, that's absolutely something that you should do. And it's absolutely something you should test because how else will you do it? You might as well do it in a practice evaluation so that, you know, maybe an aha moment can come up being like, Oh man, I do need to have these to be good at it. Yeah. So a level beyond that though, Dave, is that, so if it's within a certain distance and you have a secondary weapon, you know, if we don't teach them to transition immediately through unconscious competence, your primary, your M4 goes tits up for whatever reason, and you're not comfortable enough with enough repetitions, proper repetitions, that you go straight on to your secondary, your handgun, we're failing people, right? It, it has to, you have to do enough, enough instructional blocks and enough repetitions and sets so that they get good pro, programming in. So they understand that kind of, oh, this distance, yep, yeah, my rifle went down. I'm not going to work on that fucking magazine. You know, you know, not, I don't, I hate sports, but push, pull, rack and roll, whatever. Um, if they don't understand those concepts because you're, you're not educating them versus instructing them, when it comes push to pull um, in a collapsed environment, and you and I had this conversation on the phone with some people that didn't have a secondary, they had another secondary, which was a karambit. Remember that conversation? That was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, it looked, it looked like a voodoo sacrifice. Um, Interesting. But, yeah, so if, if you don't teach people, okay, this is going to happen sometime. This is what you do if that happens. Let's do a bunch of fucking good repetitions, groupings. Let's talk about it after each grouping. Let's, let's have some Socratic method. Well, why should I carry this karambit or this fucking K-bar or whatever where I'm carrying it? Because it allows you to access it in a fucking hasty you know, manner in case shit goes fucking sideways and you can do this, this, and this with it. You know, we don't, we, you know, if you have instructional blocks and you're just regurgitating the PowerPoint and the fucking, you know, the fucking FM, you don't understand why you're doing it and you're not going above and beyond that. You're not really doing your job as an instructor. No, I, I agree. I agree with you a hundred percent. I think my, um, so, so using a secondary and having a secondary and being able to actually employ it is actually important. I think it's one of those things that as far as, you know, um, as an organization, I think that we haven't really put much stock in, in it. Um, hopefully that changes quote, quote, um, in the future. What, what I do see a lot is that again, the, um, and it's both in your guys' realm and our realm. If, if, if it's not a requirement, it's not going to get done, you know, unless somebody's passionate about it and actually takes charge of it. As far as an instructor, I mean, I call me crazy. This is this is just me. Maybe it's a generational thing. Like, regardless of whether I was the the low man on the totem pole in the team, I considered myself an asset because I was leading in anything I could do. 
if my job was to carry a med kit, guess what? I was the best damn med kit person possible. And I asked whatever question and I tested my equipment to make sure I could do it. So it, it goes down to basically like no matter where you're at, you can be an asset or a liability, right? Well, an instructor can be the same thing. Um, if you're not training your people to use their equipment and practicing an environment based off of what they're going to be um, in, I guess, the environment in which they're going to be operating in, then you're not, you're, you're, you're renting space, you're not owning it, if that makes sense. Ian, what do you think? So this, uh, this, this conversation reminds me of um, knowing your audience and evaluating them, with knowing what their gaps are uh, to make them uh, a more holistic, I um, um, don't want to use the word operator, but uh, person. Um, and it, and it kind of, where am I going with this? You, you just have to know where the gaps are. And, and unless you're doing a baseline assessment of, of, of where your folks are, then you're never going to know what that gap is that you need to train. So um, I remember one time some uh, Air Force kid was looking at us all weird, like, what are you doing with a map? We've got Blue Force trackers. We've got GPS. We've got all sorts of other things going on. And come to find out, the kid does, doesn't even know how to read a map properly. So um, it had more to do with him not knowing how to do something that tied him to uh, a manner of operating that was just not right. Yeah, my brain is not working right now. I like um, I like coffee. You like ice cream, I know. I like I fucking love ice cream. No, so I mean, from from your standpoint, you know, what do you see as the major impediment um, between instructor and student I can tell you what it is on the law enforcement side in my experience and it's just the instructor may have a, a curriculum that they want to present and unfortunately the students never maintain their skill sets so you always have to go back a couple levels, you have to dumb it down and we have to go back to where we're all at the line. And if there's a issue with a firearm, people have to raise their hand because they're unable to work things out themselves. And we may have the best, the coolest things that we're going to do. And this is going to be great class, but unfortunately there are always going to be those officers that we have to dumb it down for them because they don't care to excel. They don't care to, to try to improve and they don't try to, they don't care to keep up. They just, they're just striving for that minimum. We have the same thing. We actually send out a list for the commanders to sign off saying they did this, they did this, they did this, they did that. I sign them off on this, this, and that. And what it ends up being is toilet paper. Yep. Because when you show up, you're just uh, like, out of, I'm having a problem. I need to reload. Yep. Out of a class, out of a class of 30, you'll usually drop 10. You know, and obviously you have to answer the question like, hey, how come, how come this is happening? It's just like, well, okay, this, this is what we can do. We understand, hey, we're, we're losing too many guys at the beginning, and we really don't need them to do this this well right now. So let's shift this over here. So at least give them the blocks of instruction they need to actually make sure that they at least have a knowledge base to actually do it, right? Because that's fair to the student, right? If I give you a test up front that I know you're not going to pass because you don't have the requisite skills because you can't even pass the written test. Okay. I'll move this assessment back. I'll do the right thing and at least give you something as far as training. And then you can shoot. And then based off of that, you'll either stay or you'll go home. We even had it to the point where we said, Hey, you know what? If you want to stay, you can stay, but your, your unit still got to pay for it. You know, you can't, you, 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 we just won't, it'll be up to your, you know, your boss, if they want to send you home, they can send you home. If you want to stay, you stay. And then we started having problems with guys just being in disruption. Like they knew they weren't going to pass. And so it was just like, you know, um, whereas I was like, if you failed, why don't you just pay? 
if we can if we considered the grand scheme of things being a, a scale to one to ten, ten being mastery, one is beginner. So let's say we I, I'm going to start a new program with my police department, and we're going to we're going to cover skill sets one to two. Okay, no issue. People got that. Okay, now we're going to go to two, we're going to go three to four. Well, you know, not everyone can keep up, so we have to go back to one to two, and then after two in skill sets one and two over several months, maybe we might get to four, but those guys that want to get to 10 are so burnt out because they are so tired of having to go back to one and two. And I've been there. I was, I was one of those people just like, seriously, do we have to continue doing the same damn thing? Um, and that's why, that's one of the reasons why I would seek uh, mm -hmm. instruction outside of what's just provided. Um, as an instructor, that is one of the reasons why I also sought instructor out, uh, instruction outside of what is immediately around me, because I want to broaden my own personal horizons, and maybe I can bring something back that might help those ones and twos excel. It's still, okay. though, I can't motivate Shackleton, those. Things. Shackleton and better pay. That's how yep. you fix that. Yep. Yeah. Let's so, go to Antarctica. So, so Dave and I were talking about this on the phone the other night. I was asked to um, unfuck a department because their SWAT team had been doing the same shit for forever. And the training officer was like, hey, can you come in and do a block of instruction? I'm like, okay, why? You guys are good shooters because they've done the same – POI for so long, they know, they know how to game the fucking system to get good scores. They know what the fucking, they know every fucking course of fire. They know how to fucking place themselves, they know where the targets are going to be. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. I'm not going to get into the whole fucking long story. Dave and I already talked about that. But um, I, I told the training director, I'm like, look, I'm not handling fucking emails or text messages or phone calls. That's your goddamn problem. Set up the logistics. I'll be there. I'll do everything that needs to be done. Just let me know. So a couple months out, I started getting fucking emails and text messages. Hey, I can't make it. I have a thing for soccer or, you know, the church thing or my other job. Or I'm like, you know what? Not my problem. Talk to your training director. This went on and on and on. About a week out. I get a different set of fucking uh, correspondence, text message and email. Um, hey, uh, I know you're doing this thing for us. Um, if we get there early, can we sh start shooting early? And, and Dave and I had this conversation. Remember, Dave? Um, and these cats were self-starters. They're the ones you want. Like, if we get there early, can we start shooting early? I'm like, absolutely. What time does the fucking range open? Oh, we have no restrictions. Okay, tell me what time you want me to be there. Um, you know, first flight. These guys showed up early. Helped me set up the classroom and the targetry and the ranges. And we shot before everybody else got there. So when you're looking at people, and Matt was kind of alluding to this, when you're looking at the people that want to become excellent, you know who they are. You know, we got done and we had a, we had a, a, a golden connex full of fucking goddamn ammo so we could shoot as much as we wanted, which was nice. Um, but these cats wanted to do the right thing the entire time. They got there early, did the work, put in the front work did everything that was necessary to make sure that they could fucking shoot as much as possible. When the other people showed up and were whining about the, oh, let's call it Scottish weather, it was sleeting sideways kind of shit. And people were, were like, people were like, oh, I want to sit in a classroom in my patrol car. I'm like, okay, go ahead. I don't give a shit. The other guys that were there early were like, can I jump in on that spot on the line? Absolutely get in there. So, it's not just the instructor, it is the student. And Matt was talking about this. You have to go outside of what you're given and find something better. If the department doesn't offer it or the agency doesn't offer it or the unit doesn't offer it, you have to take the time 
to go find that better training on your own. Correct, Matt? Sadly so. Yeah, so, so I, I, I absolutely agree with everything um, you just said. I think, um, I think it's right that we should actually like open ourselves up to be able to actually get those people and actually put ourselves in the best position to, to make that happen. You know what I mean? But to do that first, we need to develop instructors. I mean, we have, so how do we do that? How do we do, how do we develop? I know, I know my, based off of my experience, right? Or like uh, Jose says, that same thing one, right? Like I, I know how I would do it, you know? And the first thing I would do is I would make sure that there's a certification process in, involved to make sure that whatever the students are required to do, that I have people that could actually perform at that level. The second thing I would do is that I would maximize their potential, right? So you got to get that scale that like, I want a high performer, right? With a high trust, right? So I want to know that if I send you millions of miles away or thousands of miles away, that you're going to actually do the right thing and you're going to perform to that standard. Um, you know, it, I, I tend to see a lot of instructors whine about that sort of stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, Oh, we're going away. We're going to be away for this long. It's like, you mean, I, I joined, at 18, man, to, I, I told myself I was never coming home. So, like, what's what's the deal? Like, this is the army. You're gonna leave. Like, travel's part of the agreement. It's like you gotta you gotta enjoy that stuff. Um, I like it just because you get to go and you get to check out new ways people do things and new installations and meet new people. Um, but I don't need a ritzy hotel and I don't need the two rental cars and I don't need you know the the full price per diem. You know, give me my meal in a sack and just give me all the ammo I ask for and let's get to it. Um, but that's that's part of that certification. Right? Finding that person that's like, hey, you know what? I want to do this. All I want to do is be on the range and shoot. All I want to do is teach. Um, and I know there's, there's, there's more scientific methods, but for me, that's the first thing I do is always the certification. You got you got you to gotta shift through who you got. who was. You got to shift who was given to you to find out who you want. And if all you have is two people, right, you're better off with those two people than 18 to 25. That's, that's just a fact. You got two people that know what they're doing and want to be there, way better than 20 to 25. So Matt knows. Um, I came out to Salt Lake City one time, and scheduling got jacked up or whatever. Stuff happened. We're supposed to have about 20 students. We ended up with about eight. And I completely changed what I was doing and made it more of an a, a, a instructing the instructor class for these eight kids. You know, youngsters, people that came from all, all over the Pacific Northwest and, you know, Nevada and Utah. And I'm like, hey, look, you're here. It's not what we're going to do, but we're going to do what we can because we're here together. And those about eight students completely bought into the program. They're like, okay, we can do this. This is, some good, this is going to be some cool shit. And Matt could discuss it later with you guys if you want. But, you know, what, what Dave was talking about, I don't care where I am. I don't care if it's one student or 40 or if it's all of Pendleton's MPs. I don't give a fuck. If I'm there, I'm there. I'm going to be present. I'm going to be the instructor to do what I need to do to help those people learn what they need to learn. I spent literally 14 months on the road the last time I worked. I lived in hotels. I stayed with friends. I ate fucking McDonald's and bag nasties and MREs and lived hard and lived great. But that wasn't the point. The point was I was present every time, every day on the range to make sure that the people before me got the instructional block they were supposed to get. If you're an instructor and that's not your thing, and we know certain instructors out there, they're all about the gram and the social media presence and the sponsorship and all that crap. And they would be good instructors, but that's not the point. The point is, if you're not a good instructor and you're not present for your students when you're there and they don't have anything to take away and take back to where they worked or where they do work, what is the point of what you're doing? 
if you don't feel comfortable with what you're doing and how you instruct, again, go do something else. Yeah, you can make a lot of money doing this shit, but are you really helping anybody in the long run? Probably not. And those instructors, I really don't want to have any time with them. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to have anything to do with them. I don't support them. I won't um, talk about them. There's probably 10 instructors that I would fucking recommend to people because they know what the fuck they're talking about and they give a shit. They have that emotional intelligence, that compassion, that empathy, and that intellect to impart upon their students the stuff they need to take away from the class in order to be better than what they were before they came to the class. If, you is, if you're an instructor and you, that's not your goal is to give that gift to your students, you came here with this level of knowledge. I'm going to give you this better level of knowledge. If you can't do that, do something else. Absolutely. Hey, Matt. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, go on a uh, off ramp and, and discuss something that's been bugging me about uh, trainers in general uh, in the industry. And um, it's a bit of a rant. And it's definitely a, um, a grievance. So we're talking about developing trainers. We're talking about uh, improving the lot of them. And it, what, what I've seen lately is, or are folks that, don't understand their true capabilities and limitations as an SME. Um, so I did a little digging and uh, uh, came a little prepared with some graphic aids. So when it comes to expertise and the levels of expertise, um, you need to know where you fall in, in that spectrum, in, in, in that, in that um, continuum of knowledge. So there are different ways uh, organizations have uh, categorized expertise. One is called the Dreyfus model. And uh, you can Google that and find it yourself. Uh, we all know this whole thing about uh, conscious competence and all this other stuff. But, you know, there, there are so many other ways. Six Sigma has their version. They look like belts. Heck, even the National Institutes of Health has their way of categorizing expertise. Problem that I'm seeing is that there are folks out there that don't understand what their lane is, where their expertise lies, um, they start uh, to uh, move away from their actual lane of expertise and start um, presuming that you know they've done a class, they've done, uh, they've got friends that are instructors, and then they start offering themselves up as an SME in that other realm. Stay, stay over there. Stay, stay where you belong. Stick to what you know, um, but also know what your depth of knowledge really is in that area that you do know. For example, uh, if I were, um, I'm going to get crap for this. If I were, for example, trained in the military to wrench on guns and, and, um, that is the, the breadth of my uh, knowledge, wrenching on military guns. I may not, for example, understand that when someone says, well, when you install the gas key, you may want to put, uh, you know, it's optional, but you, you might want to throw some uh, uh, a gasket sealer on there. And my response immediately is, well, according to Dash 23MP, you don't do that. Well, if you've ever been to the Colt Armorer course and in their book, it says you can use it. And if all you know is that one dimension of training, the Army's way of doing it, and you don't know the others, you don't have the right to have an opinion about why someone should not put gasket sealer on their gas key. All right. I definitely won't call myself a gunsmith. That's for certain. I'm a fucking wrench turner. Um, and it's great that maybe someone wants to um, segue into uh, other competencies, but you got to know where you fall on that spectrum. Are you uh, uh, capable of being a primary instructor? Are you capable of being an assistant instructor? And nothing's wrong with being an assistant instructor. All my primary instructors rotate into assisting other instructors. Knowing how to assist is just as important as knowing how to take take the lead. Um, so don't uh, don't don't take it as a pejorative. All the assistant instructors out there, 
it's just a necessity and it's a skill set all its own. But you have to think about the way you think about yourself. So metacognition, um, uh, great word, Pat Mac. Thank you for that uh, word for my vocabulary. It sounds like um, Mike as well. Yeah. So Mike, what are your thoughts here? Okay, I'm going to spin it in a different direction, but still kind of down the same lane. Um, <clears throat> this has been a great talk, but we've spent about the last three hours on how to be an instructor. But the problem for me, like Colonel Judge was saying earlier, is mentorship. How do we bring these folks along? And most instructors, I use the word loosely, because of the the uh, organizations and environments that at least the three of us have, have spent the majority of our adult lives in, uh, possibly law enforcement realm as well, the majority of your quote-unquote instructors are only thought of as instructors because they're on a platform. But most of the people actually presenting instruction have never been, nor there will ever be, on a platform in a schoolhouse. And the way the Army works, if you're not on orders to be a platform instructor, you're not going to get to the instructor course. So where does that leave these people? It leaves, we'll say, using the Army's own uh, propaganda, your instructors are supposedly the top 10% of their field. If that's true, I don't know. I've, I've asked people if they could get me the actual numbers of X number of people in these rank in these MOSs versus these number that hold these three additional skill identifiers as drill sergeant or instructor or whatever they couldn't come They're up the with. They're the top ten percent of that's the people the available. Right, but that's that's beside the point. We're eh, we're going way down the weeds. So we'll say ninety percent plus or minus are not given the benefit of these courses. These courses do the experiential learning model. These courses do get into how to set up a classroom, how to present a block of instruction, how to use a Socratic method, how to do all these things. But the majority of these people, as we discussed earlier, if all they're getting is their, their PME, their professional military education, they get broad brush strokes across shallow wave tops and they don't really get into depth. So what, what are we doing? We are, if we're trying to develop instructors, we need to look at a mentorship program, whether it's official, unofficial, because both mentorship programs are real. And we need to be exposing people to these, these, these concepts. Tradoc publications, there are numerous Tradoc publications on instructors, instructing, all of this stuff. There's actually doctrine. What is it? TC uh, what dash one Oh two Dave seven dash one Oh two. For what? I want to say, uh, for, for training ADP. I want to say it's, no, it's, it's a, I think it's uh, ADP seven dash zero. That's training seven, seven dash zero. And then I believe TC seven dash one Oh two. I may be mistaken. Somebody's going to look it up and tell me I'm wrong, whatever. But you've got to take it on yourself to learn these things. Case in point, I went through a train the trainer course in 2003. This train the trainer course taught me how to set the system up, how to run the system, how to qualify people. That was it. It didn't teach me how to teach anything. It was, okay, guys, you're the trainers. Here's how you set the system up and run it. And through going to courses on, on the economy, that's where I learned. That's where I cut my teeth. Yes, ADP 7-0, but there's also a TC, Dave. Uh, look the TC up, please. Um, but on the economy, I, I learned about andragogy. Again, not in any great depth, but learned about it. Oh, this is interesting. Let me read it and research it. Went to Pat Mack and he talked about metacognition. What is this cool word? Let me look it up. And that led me along my passion. And, and I say it's a passion because it truly is. There's nothing more rewarding to me than imparting something on someone and watching them excel. 
And it's even more rewarding still knowing that that's something that will potentially at some point save their life or save the life of another, which led me into going to grad school and it's going to lead me into the master's degree program next. It, that's where I'm coming back is to try to give back and expose these people to the, to the things that I was not exposed to and, and try to help. You know, we're talking andragogia, we're talking the ELM, we're talking metacognition, we're talking Bloom's taxonomy, we're talking the, the 12 different ways of expressing the same things that Ian just showed. And if we want to develop instructors, we need to look at their, their personality. And if we have the, the, the luxury of selecting who we want, which within the organization, you've got who you've got. If you're in a schoolhouse, you can be a little bit more selective, but if you're in the organization, you've got who you've got. So we need to push these people, expose them to these things, and every one of them is not gonna see the value. They're not gonna get it. Of those that see the value, every single one of them is not gonna get it, understand it, build the competency. But if we can touch six out of every 10, and have six out of every 10 at least understand the concepts and have a baseline of two or three or four different adult learning theories and be able to mesh the different theories and have them being able to work within the three domains of learning using the three types of learning and get through to their students there's no stopping them. And even though we keep talking marksmanship, marksmanship, weapons proficiency, this is the, these are the things that we are very involved in. But if you take a person and teach them how to teach and teach them the ADDIE process of analyzing the need, developing their TNOs, developing and, and planning their blocks of instruction, developing their, uh, their evaluations, and then doing an assessment on, on how the program ran, whether it was effective, and building that into the next run of the program. If we can get them doing these things, it's not just weapons. Ian, or I, or Dave, or Matt, or Mike, any one of us could take any skill that we've learned, use the same concepts, and teach that skill to others. Today, we're teaching weapons proficiency. Then we get tasked with, hey dude, I want you to teach uh, basic first aid. I want you to teach how to apply, how to, how to apply a tourniquet. Okay, let me, let me dig into my doctrine. Let me make sure all my notes are straight. All right, develop my program. We come back out on that day, all right, folks, here's how you're going to apply a tourniquet. You can apply the same concepts to any block of instruction, any subject, as long as you know the subject. This is what we need to be developing towards. So on the subject of developing and, and, and sustaining uh, a cadre of instructors, um, we, a shortfall that we experience ourselves, Dave and Mike and others in, in, in the army anyway, uh, we have no continuing education requirement. How do we sustain? How, how do we keep people on that learning curve? Uh, I, the bar, the state bar of California, you, you've got to have 25 hours of uh, continuing education every three years. Uh, I don't know what they do on the, mil on the LE side, but um, I think a shortfall is that we do not have any sustaining requirements for the instructor level of, of not maybe TRADOC does, but you know, university across the board for a, a random NCO to be an instructor on something, we, we don't have a requirement for that. So um, should there be, and, and what do you guys do on the law enforcement side? Do you have one? So for here, you have to have 40 hours a year. And that 40 hours is divided up into everything. Not just firearms instructor, it's also defensive tactics, um, community policing, and a bunch of other stuff. So when it comes to law enforcement here, 
um, hire has to determine first priorities. What is most critical for the department or the agency? Do we need to focus more on community policing and the components that go into that? That requires um, the department to divide people out to do the training with training officers and make sure we have enough people in the field to handle patrol calls. Well, those other people are training. That requires um, a lack of resources in the field and money elsewhere. And then you have to rotate people through that entire process for that one, con what, that one training block. Then you have other training blocks. You have to do the same thing all over again. So when it comes to law enforcement, it's a matter of priority and funding and, and um, resources such as time. Um, so it's hard to get people to understand, the public to understand that if you want better law enforcement, you have to, pre you have to give them the resources to do the training. And you also, the law enforcement, or excuse me, the public does not also understand that um, some things take priority over others based on certain social impacts in a certain community over a period of time. If you have certain problems, you change your focus from, let's say, firearms training. Here we get uh, two qualifications a year. Um, part of it's under low light or no light, most of it's daytime. Or does most of the shooting happen in law enforcement? Low light or no light, but it, it, that's tangential. Anyway, if you want better cops, you have to give them the time and the money to do the training to be better cops. We societally don't give them that. The military is a little bit different. So if you want better shooters or better cops or whatever you have to set up the system in such a way that they can have that program in place in order for them to be better what they're at what they're doing 40 hours isn't a lot over a year i mean ian you're talking 25 hours where you are that's not shit so you have to prioritize it, and that's based on your environment and your community and assets and resources available. You know, I, I mean, I, 25 hours, really? In most instances, no, the, uh, the public is expecting on a scale of 1 to 10, about a 12 in service professionalism, proficiency, all that kind of stuff, but they're only willing to pay a 2. So the 25 hours, I, I was re referencing the State Bar of California for attorneys, practice of attorneys. I just use it as an example. That's not what we have here for instructors. Yeah, but okay, so, okay, let's, let's take this a different way. If your department or agency at the post level requires, let's say here, 40 hours, if you give a shit about your job, you should find something beyond your 40 hours. On your own. Um, one of my big pet peeves here is I see so many fucking cops that are out of shape and not qualified to do the goddamn job. I don't see that with firefighters here or paramedics, but with LE, I do. They just simply don't give a shit. Now, that's okay. Here, let's take, let's take, we're, we're really loud on cops where I live. Um, Let's say it's 100 officers at our department to make the math easy. Here, we'd have about 10 phenomenal give a shit cops. You'd have about 60% um, that are good cops, but not exceptional like the 10%. The rest are just punching a time clock. I don't want that at an agency or department. I want people to strive to be excellent. Yes, people are burned out, people are close to retirement, people are just starting and don't know what the fuck they're doing yet. People are injured, people have other issues with you know other shit. But for the most part, I would like to see a ratio of like, oh, I don't know, 70, 30. We don't get that, you know? So if that's not, if that's not what you wanna do, do something else. Because the public counts on you to be excellent all the time. I understand it's not possible, but you should strive to be that way. 
if you're an instructor in a block or an agency or a unit or whatever, you're not pushing people to be better than that, then why are you there? I was teaching a block on lead abatement at the academy because it's a problem. And another instructor was helping me. When we were done with the class, he pulled off his vest that was covered in shit and put it in the back of his SUV in his child seat, therefore contaminating it. He didn't give a fuck. He was just there to punch a clock. Me? Hey, bro, you know, you probably shouldn't put that shit there because of A, B, and C. Oh, really? So we don't, we don't get excellence in a lot of instances because people just don't give a shit. They're just, they're just getting a paycheck. I don't want to deal with people like that. Sorry, but I just don't. I just checked the uh, post portal. And as of, let's see here, right now, in this year, so starting July 1st to present, I'm at 133 hours of training. I'm only required to have 40 per year. So, so going, going back to that, right? So there's, there's no hour requirement. I, uh, if, if you put an hour requirement on it, that's what people are going to do. That's the minimum they're going to do. I mean, no matter what, people are going to seek that minimum. Oh, exactly. Right. So that's, this is where I, as an instructor, no matter what I'm instructing, you know what I mean? I think you should do an evaluation. You should, you should, it should be an evaluation, do it two, three, four times a year. Right. And it's going to be a surprise. You know, like I know, I know, you know, as, you know, as, as a, as a guy who has a ranger tab and stuff like that, I still have buddies and instructors who call me up, say, Hey, what's, what's that, what's that ranger standard looking like, you know? And we, we post it up on the interweb like, Hey, yeah, I can still do the requirement at least physically to actually achieve that time clock and all. It's like, are you, are you wearing it or are you bearing it? You know, uh, I don't, I don't know if you guys can do that, but I'll, I'll, obviously that's, that's peer pressure. You know, that's, 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 that's something you can do. I mean, I don't know, fat shame people if you want. I mean, if you want to do that, but I, I, I don't know. I know that as an instructor, that's like, that could be something you could put in your, your review. Um, but if we're talking about developing, you know, as instructors, then again, I'm very, I'm very big fan of if somebody comes to you out of shape, if somebody comes to you in a deficiency, right? You can't look at it as like, I don't want this person, right? You can't, you got somebody, you know what I mean? Don't, don't give up on it until you actually have to. Right, let them self self select, um, and I think that their ability is going to depend on your evaluation, your ability as an evaluator. Um, I going back to what what Mike was saying, you know, it's like instructor development, like certifications, right? Critical task evaluations, you know, after actions reviews. There's so many tools that you have, you know. I, I just sent you guys over the thing here. There's there's plenty of stuff written on leader development. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's all there, right? What's, what's the issue? There's not a requirement and nobody's motivated to do it unless they are. Again, passion gets you in the door, but it doesn't mean you're going to make it. So I kind of have a running thing with my agency where if, if, a, if a friend comes out to, to uh, the area, even Utah in general, and they're teaching some form of a class, I will pay for someone's tuition to go, to go out and attend the class. Uh, I've, I've paid for several Bill Blower's course or several slots at Bill's class when he came out here. Uh, I don't believe anyone from my agency went, but I paid for a couple deputies. Um, and then uh, John Dufresne came out. I was going to pay for one of my coworkers. No, he didn't, he didn't want to do it. I, I uh, contacted the local uh, SWAT team commanders and said, if you guys will go to Darcy, I will pay for your tuition. I will pay for your Sims, your travel, your housing, and your everything, any, a rental. Well, if the agency wanted us to go to this, they'd pay for it. So this is the, like that's, the top counterterrorism. Yeah, and it's the that's top the counterterrorism wrong. course. Yeah. It's like, dude, you have the responsibility of protecting yourself with a gun. Yep. At the end of that thing, a projectile is going out and you're going to be responsible for it. 
So, so we can provide these options. We can provide all these opportunities. And in the end, if they don't take it, we can't do anything. I can give the, the, you, you the can't, best reward. Can't, oh, well. You can't, yeah, you can't force someone to invest in their own survival. Okay. Yeah, Matt McNamara you know, was telling me that uh, he offered his local police department free training. They didn't take him up on it. Yeah, but sometimes it's the opposite. So I was at Montana doing Air and Marine, and um, a dude came out for the three-day pistol course, and he's like, yeah, I'd really like to take your rifle course, but I don't have a gun, I don't have any ammo. I'm like, dude, I got an extra gun. I'm sure we can find the fucking ammo. And I'll let you take the class for free. And I'm like, I talked to his, you know, his boss. I'm like, can, can he jump in if I give him the slot? We don't have the money to pay for it. I'm like, I'm not going to fucking charge him for it. I already got 25 students. What, one, what, what difference does one more student from your organization mean to me? Nothing. And I'm like, you're cool with that? I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm cool with that. To have him jump in. So I took him aside and said, here's my fucking extra rifle. We've all pooled our ammo. You're good to go. You know, just show up and you'll be cool. We'll, we'll take care of your hotel. And the dude was all over it. Dude was high shooter because he gave a shit. It was his craft. He cared. He was there for a reason. So sometimes it's the opposite of what we see. We, we, we lament and whine and pinge and fucking caterwaul about the people that don't do it. But sometimes there's that dude that wants to do it. And you have to open the door and fucking hand it to him because... If you don't, he's not going to get it. If you have the capability of saying, hey, bro, here's a free slot, take advantage of it. Sometimes that's the person you want in the class. I did a thing with the Marines in Virginia, and they had a strap hanger. He was the biggest fucking nerd, calm, geek, weenie motherfucker I've ever seen in my life. He looked like Barney Fife, right? Didn't know shit about shit. Ended up being the high shooter and understood everything at the end of the class. Outshot a lot of hard motherfuckers because he paid attention. He wouldn't have been there if there hadn't been a slot. So sometimes as an instructor, you have to create the space in the environment for that one um, tangential, obscure person to jump in because they may be the dude, right? We're talking about, uh, Ian was talking about, you know, who does machine guns? right? Motor T, you know, transport, right? They're not the normal person, but they're the person who's going to do fucking, you know, area denial for fucking force protection. The guy that can run the machine gun. It's not necessarily infantry. It's the guy that can run the machine gun. Do you train those people on that? This comm we need from the Marine Corps, who I'm sure is working for some fucking three to ledger agency now. Um, Nobody thought that guy could fucking shoot, but he listened and paid attention. He had a slot, and he fucking ran with the fucking class prize. So don't discount those guys because they're there. You know, make those opportunities as an instructor and, and encourage them and mentor them and, you know, maybe baby them initially until you find out their quality and then fucking let them go. Yeah, and that's, that's totally part of that development too. I mean, I can tell you right now that I've, I've had people take chances on me. You know what I mean? And I mean, we can be honest, philosophically, like we probably don't deserve any of the chances we've ever had. You know what I mean? But people still took that time. Um, just recently, Ash got, you know what I mean? I couldn't, I couldn't get to the match, right? He gave me a rifle and he found me a sponsor, you know, and Adam was willing to, to sponsor me to go in there. And man, I had a blast. I was only able to go there for a day, right? Because the family stuff going on. But you know what? Dude, I, I, I had a great time. You're, you're going to find people out there that want to help you out. And those are the true instructors to do that. And they did do that because they learned that from somebody else. Yeah. You know I mean, that's part of being a good instructor. It's part of just being a good dude. I'm afraid with the late hour, we probably should wrap things up. And I think Ian is about to turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> so one last thing, look, a good instructor will make them themselves available all the time as much as they possibly can considering self-care i did a class we got done with the poi and kind of the rule of thumb with what i was doing was day three of a three-day carbine rifle class at 1700 we, we tanked the class we were done but we weren't done 
so I asked the students, I'm like, Hey, you know, we're not quite done. Do you mind shooting till we're done? They're like, absolutely not. I said, listen, I will stay here till we have no light. We'll get everything done you want plus more. As an instructor, if you're not willing to do that, you're just punching the clock, you're wrong. You know, those people took time out, to, you know, LE, civilian mostly, not military, but those people took time out and spent a lot of coin and took a lot of, took a lot of opportunities or lost opportunities to go attend that class. It's your job as an instructor to be there until the very end. Not until the fucking POI is done, but until they're done. Because that's why they're there. That, sh that shows your commitment and willingness to be a good instructor, to be a mentor. Hey, um, we're done with the class, but we really haven't shot to you know, 300 on steel. Got the steel? This was in Montana. Yeah, go set that steel up. We'll fucking shoot it. Yeah, but we're done. It's 1,700, so fucking what? We've got four more hours of light. Go fucking put that steel up. That's a good instructor. If you can't do that, you don't care about doing that, you know, I'm sorry. Do something else. It's not your job. You know, if you don't have that passion to go the extra mile to make sure that everybody walks away from what you're doing better than what they started with, you're not worth a shit. If I if I can add to that uh, briefly before I uh, do my final comments, um, I, I think it's incumbent on the instructor to also understand what the limit of saturation is for your student body. You've got to know when just to call it, even if it means not going as long in the day as you had initially planned, because at that point, they're faking the funk, they're not getting good reps in, uh, you're just making a loud noise, uh, accidents can happen. Uh, you know, it's like going on a long, uh, on a long, uh, long run. You know, your injuries are going to occur in the last couple of miles, not not the first. Things get sloppy. So, uh, I, I I agree with you. Uh, uh, train the standard or or get the mission done without regard to the time. But at the same time, I think um, good instructors should be aware of uh, the state of fatigue and, and, and the mental capacity of the student body at some point. I know some instructors, they, they cap the number of rounds per day that they shoot, uh, because beyond that day, they just don't feel like it can, uh, uh provide any value added benefit. So, uh, throttling up, throttling down, uh, I, I, that's an important aspect to, uh, being a good trainer. And, uh, I think, uh, an important part of that is wearing the exact same kit and setup that your students are, because you know, the fatigue level, you know, if they're, you know, uh, they need to take a break. You, you understand um, uh, where they are on, the, on that fatigue scale. So, uh, and then not, not only that, it, it removes any other gripe that they might have about you being able to perform a drill versus them when they're in their kit, that holster with whatever. But I just kind of went off on a tangent, sorry. No, so Ian, look, you know, I, I, I taught classes where it was ridiculously hot or phenomenally cold. And I'm wearing the same kit, and I understand the suffer fest they're going through. And I would, I would adjust the amount of repetitions and sets based on how I felt, because I'm in pretty good shape. And we had some people that were not in good shape. And I would make them, like, we'll, we'll take a class in Casa Grande, Arizona. Or, or we did a class in Albuquerque with Border Patrol and Bortac. Um, these guys were in good shape, but they weren't in great shape. I kept track of everything. I ran three thermometers, a wet bulb globe index thermometer, uh, a, a regular thermometer, and a thermometer on the ground. And I kept track of all three fucking temperature ratings. When it got to a certain fucking um, index, um, after so many repetitions, I made them take their shit off completely. And I stopped doing certain repetitions and made them fucking sit down for 45 minutes and hydrate and chill because they weren't going to be safe and perform to standard in those conditions in that fatigue, dehydrated, fucking stress-induced state. As an instructor, if you don't know how to gauge that, you're wrong. If you don't know how to adjust your POI to, a, to accommodate those environmental weapons, or excuse me, uh, WX um, uh, environments, 
you're you're wrong. And yeah, you can punch the clock and go through the POI and the blocks and stuff. But if you don't fucking have some understanding of how the lowest common denominator in your class is functioning, you're creating a safety um, hazard for everybody else. And yeah, so that's 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 exactly why having that certification, right, to provide that education portion, whether it's environmental considerations, you know what I mean, and conditions, and just being just un, like even no matter what the subject you're doing, just covering that whole like spectrum and being able to get people to understand that part, right? And mainly creating those systems and processes that allow you to basically account for that, right? To account for resources and everything like that. Is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah, but I mean, how many, how many instructors, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, actually utilize best practices. I mean, I was doing that thing in Albuquerque and Casa Grande in really ridiculous temperatures. And I made them, you know, I kept track of their hydration. I'm like, look, motherfucker, I haven't seen you drink. Take your shit off. You're going to skip this fucking, you know, time on the line and you're going to hydrate. Not just water, but something with electrolytes. Oh, and by the way, stick out your finger. I'm putting a pulse ox on you to see what your temperature your fucking, you know, oxygen saturation and your pulse is. You know, you have an accelerated pulse. Man, probably I should set this one out. How many people actually go through those steps? Not very many. You know, I was doing a thing at Pendleton. I had a fucking corpsman who was a fucking Nazi when it came to this shit. And you know what? It saved a bunch of people's ass because we didn't have to fucking send them to sick bay. You know? No, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not disagreeing with you that that isn't the normal, right? What I'm saying is, where do they find those best practices and how do we start providing that education so that if somebody is or wants to become an instructor, they can go there and be like, this is what I need. Hey, I need to, I need to get some, some, some education, some mentorship from somebody who actually does this. Okay, you know, but that's, where, that's where lethality ranch I think is going to shine because you're going to be able to go there and it's going to be, be a secondary source of you being like, okay, I got this book, right? Over here, I got all this information, right? But here, here, this is what I'm available, right? So if, if you have, if you're in the army, right? We have, you know, we have something for that. You know I mean? We have a, a weapons and gunnery page, you know, on, on, the, um, on the pages for, for cat card users. But, but there's nothing out there for somebody just trying to do it at, at your guys' level. Well, like, but hey, see, what if so, I was able? What if I was able to provide you? Let's let's say you wanted to just do a, a stability lesson plan, right? To teach stability, and I was able to provide you a copy of a program of instruction for it, with all the resources, all the safety things, and a how to to build exactly what you need based off the resources you have. Like, who would say no to that, right? Or who who would say no to say, hey, you know what? I'm wanting to know how I'm doing at, you know, at teaching. Is there anybody that has some like? student evaluations where I can get good feedback, you know? I think, uh, I think those are assets, but more importantly than that, somewhere to go to be like, hey, how do I build those surveys? Or hey, how do I build a lesson plan that encompasses everything that I can take anywhere in the world to teach something? Right, you know? so Dave, but here's the problem is that on my side of the block and Matt's side of the block, we don't have that organized instructional tm resource we can um utilize it doesn't exist what right? the military are you waiting for but you do but you do huh? all the all the references that we've been discussing every one of them is open source no i understand every, that i understand that i understand that but hmm. but le won't touch it i mean they might if they're smart but uh, so when it came to helping develop a shoot house, certain, a certain place in the United States. And, um, when it came to doing, um, safety for a shoot house, I talked to a friend who taught at debt one in the Marine Corps. I'm like, how do you fucking do this? So, cause this is how we did it. Here's my fucking instructional blocks. Here's all the TMs. Here's all the fucking, here's all the architecture. Here's all the plans. Here's all the blueprints. Here are all the safety regulations and considerations. You know, I took advantage of that. 
but the average person in law enforcement doesn't want to fucking dig into that and do the research and do the homework. They just don't. So it's available on your side and it's available open source for us, but the so average the same thing, huh? yeah. it's, you run into the, the same problem, right? You can't, you know, you can't get somebody to invest in their own survival if they don't want to. No, exactly. So, you know, so this facility, I'm like, Hey, look, you know, this has to be changed. This isn't safe ballistically. You need to build up this berm. Here's why. And you hear the, hear the studies and they're like, okay, we'll do that. And it's a good facility, right? It wasn't, it didn't start off that way, but because I showed them the fucking documentation, they're like, oh fuck, I didn't realize that. I'm like, well, now you do fix this shit. So you can have this world-class facility. Now they do, but most fucking people don't want to fucking stretch their legs and do more than the bare minimum and the lowest common denominator to make a good program, no matter what it is, you know? So we have these gaps in um, training modules or instructional ve development because people don't want to do more than the bare minimum. I mean, we, we do this stuff. So if, if, if anybody listening wants, wants some extra pair of eyes on something, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to help. But, uh, just sounds like I have some job security uh, once this thing's done. <laughs> yes, indeed. So quickly, how would you guys, in a couple sentences, address instructor burnout? For us, it's rotate out. So for burnout, it's rotate out, but... Sometimes it's not necessarily to rotate out. It's to do something different within that structure. Yep. So if you're a prime instructor, sometimes it's good to take time off from that to be AI or to develop the POI or change the environment that you're training in. You know, so if you're going to build a shoot house, um, targetry package for a seven day class, you know, maybe you shouldn't be the primary instructor. Let's fuck around with the targetry and shot placement and, you know, the gimmicks and whatnot. Do that, you know, so you can take some time off mentally and cognitively and catch a breath. You know, you're still within the system, but you're not doing the hard fucking work. Um, and then find some meaning into what you're doing. I, I mentioned earlier you know, my, one of my best things I ever got was the guy that fucking listened to me about going wide, going around a building, and it saved his ass. Sometimes all you need is a little bit, a little bit of feedback and rec recognition for what you did that saved somebody's ass. And that can spur you on for another six months. But sometimes you're like, I, fuck, I can't do this anymore. You know what? Take the time off. Go do something else recharge your batteries it's up to an individual instructor to know where that limit is and if you don't know where the limit is talk to other instructors they've been through it also and they can mentor you and say hey you know what you seem burned out take some time off or handle the fucking paperwork or handle the fucking logistics of targetry and ordering targets and ammo and shit but stay off the range and it, it's important to rely on those other people that are within your industry or your instructional block or your mentorship to fucking help you with that. You know, you have to do that on your own. Uh, and other instructors, if they see you're not doing it on your own, should, if they're good instructors, should step in and say, hey, bro, step back for fucking two months or whatever. You're burned out. Anyone else? Does that pretty much cover it? Because to me, that sounded really good. Okay, Ian, final thoughts, plugs, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, plugs. So four hours, uh, all my final thoughts are <laughs> they're in the rearview mirror. So anyway, um, I mentioned before, and I was kind of uh, exaggerating the, the degree to which I was pimping lethalityranch.com, but here's my time to actually do it. So uh, what Mike and uh, Dave and Todd um, 
what we're doing with it is to provide a resource that can show people specifically in the army, but again, it's cross domain, across, cross sectors, um, uh, what the doctrine says about uh, weapons training, um, how to do it right, just various uh, articles on, on, um, on uh, again, my brain is fried right now. But what I'm getting at is if you log on to the website, you'll see at the top left corner uh, a menu item called exclusive. So for the primary and secondary viewers, uh, Mike and I, we kind of joined forces on a giveaway. So off the bat, uh, for the Army folks, uh, you all know that uh, we're going through some drastic uh, um, small arms training qualification changes. And it's got a lot of people worked up about uh, what that means for the unit, uh, what that means for the soldier, and what that might mean for, um, uh, if you're in the National Guard anyway, uh, your state guard and, and the deployment cycle, things like that. So anyway, uh, I've developed uh, some senior leader briefings that specifically talk about it. So if you go to that uh, website, if you hit exclusive, uh, and in there you plug in primary, because it's passworded, primary, uh, there's a sign up page for the giveaway. Uh, freebie off right off the bat via auto uh, responder for the email. I'm sending you a complete uh, briefing packet on uh, the new qualification standards. Um, oh, power mode. Oh, did I lose you guys? Nope, there you are. Uh, you can customize it any way you want. Tons of good stuff in there. I'm also sending you a frequently asked questions document covering the new stuff. Now, for the mic aspect of it, you will be entered to receive uh, 25 copies of his mill, 25 copies of his MOA, as well as a complete set of zero tools that look like that, in case you don't know, that one there is for the PEC-15. You'll also receive a different tool for the day site on the M4, as well as a group gauge. Um, so that will uh, run for 30 days. We'll pick winners, we set the winners for all that stuff uh, at the end of the 30 days. So go there, lethalityranch.com, hit exclusive, password is primary and sign up. Uh, we promise we're not gonna spam you. We'll, we'll just send you one email at tops a month, uh, if that at all. But um, just wanna drive traffic there. So um, uh, that's all I got, man. I, I had a great time here tonight. And of course, it's great seeing these knuckleheads. Um, Dave, we, we gotta go across over to uh, Alabama again sometime soon. Mike Lewis. Okay. Yep. As always, good time. Um, hit Lethality Ranch. Um, I'm excited about Ian spinning that thing up. Uh, the targets, again, uh, the 9129 25-meter MOA, the 9130 25-meter multipurpose mill, or the 9131, that's a 100-meter mill target. Uh, those are 35% off running through 1 February. If you email Deborah at writingtherain.com. Um, also, since we've been on the topic tonight of training and education during the lead in, um, I am doing training and education with the focus of leader development. I've got a couple courses spun up uh, to, to develop leaders as trainers for rifle carbine, for all squad organic weapons, and for the, uh, the belt feds within the rifle company. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at Kim Kane Break Consulting Services or hit the website at www.keenbreak.us. As always, good times. Thanks, gentlemen, and thanks for having me back, Matt. Anytime. Dave. Uh, first, hey, thanks, thanks for having me. This is uh, this has been pretty cool. I already I, I learned a lot. Um, Mike's uh, Mike's got some stories, man. Holy smokes! I uh, love talking with him. Um, leadership is everything when it comes to this stuff. Um, if you don't have the right leadership, you're never going to have the systems and processes in, in place so that you can get those good people. Right? If you don't advertise it right you're going to start getting people that want to be there for the incentive, not the work. Um, you know, everybody, everybody loves incentives, right? But those should be secondary to the, to the purpose. Um, and so just thanks. I can't wait to uh, you know, hang out with Ian again <laughs> and uh, see Mike and, um, you know, just 
next February, I think. Are we gonna are, are we are we gonna go shoot again? Pretty sure. Yeah. All right. And then um, just thanks for having me. And uh, if anybody needs anything, they I'm I'm too easy to reach. I'm on Facebook or something like that. Or something yeah. like that. Or something like that. It's sad because you never got into who you were, why you were here, all that kind of stuff. It's okay. Well, I'm not gonna get into that. <laughs> I appreciate it. Mike? Yeah, a couple things. Um, remember, life is a fucking suffer fest. How you deal with it is on you. You can make it um, interesting or you can uh, succumb to it. Or what we're talking about in a lot of instances is um, how you deal with it. So if you want to jump into something tangential, read um, The Unfettered Mind by Takuan Soto or Playing Ball on Running Water. It talks, those, both those books talk about how to overcome the obstacles in your life. One, The Unfettered Mind is about uh, no mind, which is a very Zen concept. And it applies to what we're talking about here. And playing ball on one, playing ball on running water, is marine therapy, psychotherapy, which is developed after World War II in Japan. How to overcome obstacles. So you want to do some cool reading on your own time. The books are very thin. Um, these might be useful to you in whatever you're doing. They're applicable completely. Um, and that's about it. So I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the modcast and you took something valuable from it and that you continue listen to, if you, to continue listening to in the future to uh, primary and secondary and Matt Landfair. I guess that's okay to say. Will another good discussion, another good discussion. Uh, I think we're already going to be having a sequel to this. It's funny how that works. I'm um, I'm down. I, I really want to get into the mentorship part. I think I think that's something that we we couldn't hit. But again, um, just the, with the discussion, it was pretty awesome. Good, a good start. Yep, yep. And I think and I think we have a great panel for it. And especially when we have people with that passion, and that passion is what's separating us from everyone else. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know you guys. You guys were under those kinds of conditions, man. I, I, I yeah. did. Um, and and this is yeah for for me and for what Mike's discussed. Uh, these are our experiences. It doesn't mean all law enforcement is like that. Yeah. But I wouldn't be surprised if a majority was. So we, I've I've done some training with both uh, like the the guys to the left and right, pretty much on the state side, so, so public safety stuff, and and I I. I I kind of, it makes sense now. I mean, good, some, some good information, but it was all different. And I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Absolutely. Policies, procedures, all so, yeah, yeah, all that kind of stuff Com can be completely different. Just going from one agency to the other and they're right next door. Oh yeah. That's, I mean, if that's, think of that, if that's havoc on you, imagine what it's like for the citizens. Well, not, it's not so bad for them. Yeah, because like, they, they'll just call the wrong numbers anyway for emergencies, and <laughs> they, they do. You know, is, so is is it like uh, it's like Domino's and Papa John's? Is this like they'll call whichever one they prefer? <laughs> yeah, call in the office when there's an emergency. It's like no, call nine one one. Oh yeah, I gotcha. Oh, that's horrible. What can you do? But yeah, great discussion, good times. Uh, big thanks to to uh, let's start with Philster Holsters. Uh, ambidextrous, near universal, appendix, compatible with TLR1 and the X300U. That's a floodlight. If you need one of those, you should probably buy it right now. Facts on firearms, if you need a threaded barrel for your pistol or an AR barrel or any of those parts that they offer. Facts on firearms. Uh, Walther firearms, Walther arms. Matter of fact, uh, I have a PP. I have a PPK right next to me, but yeah, the PPS, I can't believe how inexpensive it is. Like if you go to Bud's Guns, 
or places like that online, the pricing on the PPS, a single stack, nine mil, little concealed carry pistol. Really, it's a great little pistol. If you're looking for something that's close to the size of a Glock 19, check out the PPQ. Uh, big thanks to the Patreon subscribers. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the network. We got some cool stuff that's just about to be released real soon. With those, uh, with that, with that training, we also have a lot of swag that's being worked on. I'm very excited about that because there might be two different, um, two different themes that are being released for our training event. One you might not already be aware of. The second one we haven't said a thing about. That's going to be coming out really soon. So, good stuff. Um, make sure you are supporting those sources that you have found to be beneficial nowadays especially on social media, those likes, the shares, the subscriptions, even the comments when you're talking about these, these sources, that is currency. And the good sources are poor compared to the bad sources for the most part. There's some really cringeworthy uh, social media out there providing some bad information. And holy crap, the, the, the followers they have in the millions. And then we have people like Varg Freeborn. We have Chuck Pressburg, Bill Blowers, all these good guys that, you know, they just don't have the same following. And it's unfortunate because they are truly providing the, the best possible information. I guess that also applies to primary and secondary. So make sure you're seeking these guys out. Make sure you're following and liking and subscribing. Um, as a matter of fact, all the three people, including primary and secondary, all have, primary, or have uh, Patreon accounts. Let's see here. I think that is it. Also going to throw a big shout out to uh, Guns Guide to Liberals. John and Sarah do an awesome podcast. They're also providing some, some perspective that a lot of people are kind of missing. That's great discussions, great people. So that's all. I uh, think I'm going to end this now and figure out what we're going to do next week. So thanks for watching and listening. Thanks for your support, and we'll talk to you guys later. Later.